Snowed Over, written by Angie Stanton, narrated by Amber Wallace. Chapter One Each gust of wind shot tiny shards of sleet at Katie Brandt's already frozen face. She hadn't laid eyes on her ride, Alex Walker, yet, but already she didn't like him. He said two o'clock, and it was twenty minutes after. If there was one thing she hated, it was not keeping your word. If you say something for crying out loud, mean it, especially if it means you're leaving someone outside to freeze to death. Katie gripped her cold coffee and braced against the biting wind as she waited outside the Memorial Union for her long ride north with a complete stranger. Nothing about this holiday felt familiar or right. Ever since her parents' sudden split last June, her mom had started acting different. She decided to drag Katie and her little sister up to some guy named Bill's cabin for the Christmas holiday. Katie shivered. So Katie was forced to wait in this deep freeze to catch a ride with a fellow university student she hadn't actually met. Apparently, Alex's hometown, middle of freaking nowhere Wisconsin, wasn't far from Bill's place. Her mother referred to Bill as just a friend. But Katie wasn't stupid. Forty-something newly divorced women didn't suddenly force their unwilling kids away from every holiday tradition they'd ever known to hang with a friend. Katie's teeth chattered as she turned her back against another sub-zero gust. Her long hair tangled in the wind. She pulled her cell phone from the pocket of her down coat, checking again for a text or message from the extremely tardy Alex. Nothing. Her roommate's brother shared a house with Alex and a few other guys. Lindsay said Alex was super smart, totally hot, and engaged to a girl back home. Whatever. He was late. As Katie shivered and watched for his blue truck, she thought about how perfect life had been until two weeks after graduation when her dad abruptly moved across town and mom started dressing too young for her age and going out all the time. Katie's phone rang. About damn time. Her numb fingers fumbled with the phone. She checked the caller ID and sighed. Hi, Mom. Hi, honey. Are you on your way yet? Bill says that if you don't leave soon, you're going to run into snow. It was supposed to go north of us, but now it's changing direction. Katie rolled her eyes. I'm waiting for my ride. Tell me again who you're riding with. And how do you know him? I'm really not comfortable with you accepting a ride from a total stranger. I told you, his name is Alex and my roommate knows his family. A total lie. This is how college students get around, Mom. If you weren't forcing me to go to the other side of the state, I wouldn't be riding with a total stranger. Katie felt a little regret for her snarky comments but this was totally her mother's fault. Katie deserved to act like a sullen teenager. Her mom ignored her tone. I wish you could have come up with Bill, your sister, and me on Thursday. The university shouldn't schedule their exams this close to Christmas. Katie would much rather ride with an unknown college student than Bill, who she'd nicknamed not the boyfriend. What's his cell phone number? I should at least have that, her mother asked. No, not happening. You'll just call to give him the weather updates every 10 minutes. I'm not that bad, her mother said. Katie didn't respond. Okay, maybe I am, but it's only because I love you and want you safe. Katie huffed. If her mom loved her so much, she'd tell her what the heck happened to their family in the last six months. Instead, her mother kept pretending life was normal when it was anything but. Mom, my fingers are freezing off. I'll see you in five or six hours. All right, but make sure he drives careful. If it starts to snow, I want him to pull over. And if there's car trouble, call me and I'll give you my auto club number. Do you have money to stop for something to eat? I've got it under control. I'm hanging up. Goodbye.
Katie snapped off the call. How would she endure four days with her mom? They used to get along, but ever since her parents separated, she could barely stand being around her. Being away at college had been her savior. Only a few students were left on campus this close to Christmas, and most of them had the smarts to stay inside. Katie gazed longingly at the doors of the Union and thought about going in to warm up, but she didn't want to miss Alex. With her toes freezing off, she wished she'd worn the boots buried deep in her duffel bag instead of her athletic shoes. She dumped her nearly frozen coffee into the trash bin. The blast of a horn caught her attention. She turned. An old blue pickup truck idled at the curb. The guy inside waved. Finally! She adjusted her overstuffed backpack on her shoulder and hoisted her duffel bag off the frozen sidewalk while trying not to lose her purse and shopping bag full of Christmas gifts. She managed to pull open the passenger door. Hi, you Katie? His tousled brown hair stuck up on top as if he just ran his hands through it. His expressive dark eyes danced upon her. Lindsay had said this guy was a looker, and she hadn't exaggerated. Yep, you Alex? Good looking or not, Katie forced herself not to yell at him for causing her to nearly freeze to death. He nodded with a matter-of-fact friendliness, but short of an actual smile. He hopped out of the truck wearing only a gray University of Wisconsin hoodie over his broad shoulders. He seemed immune to the elements as he came around and tossed her heavy laundry-filled duffel into the back of the truck. She noticed a snow shovel, some large covered buckets, and a huge canvas bag in the truck bed. Alex stood tall and lean, maybe six foot in his boots. He reached for her backpack, but she pulled it away. Thanks, but I'll keep it with me. My laptop's in there. Okay. He reached for the shopping bag. I'll keep these up front too. They're presents. She could picture the neatly wrapped gift sliding around the back of his dirty truck. He raised an eyebrow. Suit yourself. He walked around and hopped back in while Katie maneuvered her remaining bags into the truck cab. It was a tight fit with his coat and gloves on the seat and his backpack and a couple of other bags crowding the floor. She squeezed her bags to the floor at her feet and eyed his hot coffee. Must be nice. She wiped her icy mitten across her runny nose. Jeez, it's cold out there. Katie buckled up thankful to finally be in the warm cab and out of the deep freeze. She slipped off her mittens and hat, turned the heat vents toward her, and rubbed her hands in front of the warm air. Wasn't he at least going to apologize for being so late? Here, let me turn it up. Alex adjusted the fan to blow at full speed. The temperature was already on the warmest setting. His eyes met hers, and he offered a friendly smile. Thanks. She sighed as the hot air thawed her fingers. Katie wasn't prepared for his soulful eyes framed by dark eyebrows, and he had the most perfectly shaped mouth. How was she supposed to spend five hours with this guy? Next to him, she looked like a total loser, with her drippy nose and watery eyes. She sat back and focused on the road ahead. He was engaged, off limits. Plus, his late arrival was one big check mark against him. So, you're a friend of Matt's little sister? He pulled the truck into gear and pulled away from the curb. Yeah, Lindsay. We're roommates. Thanks for giving me a ride. It saved me from two very long bus rides that would have stopped in every rural town and taken all day. No problem. Crystal River is only 12 miles from my parents. She reached in her coat pocket for a tissue and blew her nose. She imagined her nose had turned bright red. It always did when she was cold. She didn't know what to say to this guy, and they'd be spending a lot of hours together. She dabbed at her nose and stuffed the tissues away. So what's your major? Engineering. You? 
Finance. Really? Yeah, what's wrong with that? Nothing. He smiled, and it lit up his entire face. His eyes twinkled, and a small dimple appeared on the side of his cheek. She felt like a troll next to him. You just don't seem like a numbers kind of girl. She frowned. Well, I am. What did she look like to him? I didn't mean to insult you. You look like more of a creative type. He gestured toward the brightly wrapped gift sticking out of her bag and the paisley design on her backpack. I'm creative too. I just like when things make sense. When there's a right or wrong. Everything always adds up, and when it doesn't, you fix it. He checked his side mirror and merged onto the highway. Sounds like you're on the right track. Thank you. She sniffed. Mind if I listen to the hockey game? Katie was pretty sure that was code for, I don't want to make small talk with you anymore. No, go ahead. After a few minutes listening to the drone of hockey coverage, she slipped in her earbuds and turned on her music. She'd stayed up half the night studying for her stats exam. She leaned her head back, used her coat for a pillow, and closed her eyes. Alex glanced over and smiled at his sleeping passenger. Her earbuds had fallen out and her head lolled to the side, her mouth open. She must be really tired to sleep through the first two periods of the hockey game. Katie looked like a typical freshman, young and clueless. The newness of college hadn't worn off yet. She was eager, nervous, and clearly driven. Not that he was so old and worldly in his sophomore year, but the past seven months had put him through hell and back. He glanced at Katie again. Her long lashes lay against her rosy cheeks like butterfly wings. She didn't wear much makeup, and he liked that. His cell phone rang and he quickly grabbed it to avoid waking Katie. Hello? He said quietly. Please tell me you're almost here. He frowned at the annoyingly familiar voice. Not even close. But I told my mom you'd be here in time for dinner. He sighed. Trina, I told you I wouldn't get there in time to eat and that I was staying home tonight. I just finished my last final this morning. I need a break. Well, I don't. I haven't seen you since Thanksgiving, and then my grandma died and messed up the whole weekend. Alex couldn't believe he had ever agreed to marry her. Granted, she'd tricked him into it. He thought he'd fix the situation, but Trina refused to listen. This time, he wouldn't let Trina derail him when he tried to break it off. Their relationship had gone on far too long, and for all the wrong reasons. I'll be over in the afternoon of Christmas Eve. You and I need to talk, he said. Are you transferring up here? Oh my God, that would be the best Christmas gift ever. No, I'm not transferring. I'm staying in Madison. She knew why he wanted to talk and kept deluding herself that it wasn't to break up once and for all. I hate Madison. Ever since you got there, you've changed. Suddenly, you want all different things. Her whiny tone grated like nails on a chalkboard. Getting out of Ashland was the best thing he ever did. It opened his eyes to all life had to offer. Oh, before I forget... Trina changed topics faster than musicians changed keys. I was at the mall today and saw a super cute white coat with a fur-lined hood. It was on hold for someone at the checkout counter. This ugly clerk with a big nose said it was the only one left and I couldn't have it. Alex knew without hearing another word that Trina had bullied the poor clerk into selling it to her. But I made her sell it to me. I can't wait for you to see it. It's amazing. After an awkward silence, Trina's incessant chatter continued. So what did you get me? Trina, let's talk tomorrow. 
Are your mom and dad going to be around? Why? Oh my God, you want to set a date? She squealed into the phone, and Alex wished he could crush the damn thing to pieces. I'm totally coming over tonight to wait for you at your parents. No, I don't want to set a date and don't come over. Listen, I won't be home till late. I've got to drop off. He glanced at Katie. A friend. Not fair. Trina's voice turned pouty. But you have to come over on Christmas Day. I told my mom you were spending the entire day with me. She wants me to help cook dinner. If you're there, I won't have to. Alex sighed. You know I can't do that. I always help serve dinner with my family at the senior center on Christmas Day. Katie stirred and opened her eyes. The instant she saw Alex, she sat up and looked straight ahead. Listen, I've got to go. I'll talk to you soon. He hung up before Trina could argue or coerce him into promising something he couldn't deliver. Chapter 2 Katie yawned and stretched. He slid the phone into his cup holder. Have a good nap? Yeah, I was really out. She blinked a couple times. How long did I sleep? Over an hour and a half. You must have been really tired. That or you don't like hockey. He saw the corners of her mouth curl. You don't like hockey? No way! I'm going to have to pull over and kick you out. Her eyes widened for an instant, and then a smile transformed her pretty face. She turned in her seat to face him. I'm sorry. I can't follow hockey. I went to a game once, and they spent the whole time skating around and around, and then, out of the blue, someone shoots a goal. It happened so fast, I never even saw it. That's because you're supposed to pay close attention. And there's the crux of the problem. The crux? He tilted his head in question. Yes, the crux. Do you even know what that means? He laughed and watched her forehead crinkle. It means, you know, the point of the problem. The center of the problem. I don't know, it's just a word. She said, flustered. Alex eyed the traffic, grinning. He enjoyed rattling her cage. She was an easy mark. We're coming up on an exit. I'm going to gas up. Want something to eat or a bathroom break? Yeah, I'm starved. He turned on his blinker and exited the highway. Back on the highway, with a full tank, empty bladder, and hot food, Katie dug into her burger and bag of Cheetos. Alex tried to drive and take his cheeseburger apart at the same time. Can I help with that? she offered between bites. I can get it. He kept looking at the road and back to the burger lying on top of the bag. What are you trying to do? She watched as he made a mess of his burger. I'm trying to put two onion rings in there and the bun on top. Here, let me help. She reached over, added the second onion ring, and put the bun lid back on. Thank you. He picked up the oversized burger and took a bite. I've never seen someone put onion rings on a burger. You should try it. It's great, he said, chewing. I'll have to do that sometime. Try it now. There's plenty. Help yourself. He gestured to the onion rings with his burger hand. Okay. She added an onion ring and put the bun back. No, you gotta add two for maximum crunch. She shook her head and added another, then squeezed the bun down and took a bite. Well? She nodded and kept chewing. She covered her mouth with her hand. It's good. See, stick with me and you'll learn all kinds of things. If only. She couldn't begin to imagine hanging out with Alex, a totally hot, already spoken for guy. They ate in comfortable silence, except for the country music station Alex tuned in. The greasy food tasted great, but she longed for her mom's home cooking. Or would it be Bill's cooking? That thought put a pit in her stomach. How do you like Madison? 
Alex asked. I love it. I'm not real partial to walking up Bascom Hill to get to classes, but otherwise I think it's great. That hill is a beast. Katie's phone rang. She wiped her fingers on a napkin, checked the display, and answered. What's up? Hi, honey, just checking in to see what your ETA is. Mom, you're calling to make sure we're not in the ditch somewhere or wrapped around a telephone pole. She looked at Alex and rolled her eyes. I wouldn't put it that dramatically, but yes, I wanted to make sure you're safe and well on your way. Yes and yes, she snapped, a little more severely than she meant to. Good. Where are you now? Alex, my mother would like to know our exact location at this moment. Katie, you don't need to tell him I asked, her mother said. Alex chuckled. We just passed Wausau. I'd say another couple hours. Did you hear that? Katie said to her mom. Thank you. You should know that it's already snowing here and immaculating pretty fast. Bill says you're going to run into snow soon, so be extra careful. Yes, mom. Katie wanted to tell Bill what he could do with his snow. Katie, I'm serious. She turned in her seat. Alex, my mother wants you to know that it's snowing up north, and Bill says that we'll be heading into snow soon. You need to drive extra careful. She's serious. Got it, he answered, amused. Clearly, you aren't ready to talk reasonably to me. Her mother sounded irritated, which Katie didn't mind. Katie responded in a bright, cheery voice. Okay, sounds good. See you soon. She quickly hung up. She knew she should feel bad about it, but her mother brought it on herself by keeping Katie in the dark about the separation. Her mom only wanted to talk when it wasn't about their family disaster. Why was this strange guy so important that Katie was forced to drive through a snowstorm to share Christmas with him? She shoved the phone to the bottom of her purse where she wouldn't hear it ring. So, who's Bill? Alex asked. It's a long story. We've got nothing but wide open highway. Some sappy country song about a guy and his dog came on the radio. I don't really know. My mom says she isn't dating him, but she's making us haul ass up to Crystal River to spend Christmas with him, and we've never even met. And I take it you don't want to meet him? No, I don't. So your parents are divorced? That's an excellent question. I don't think so, but things are moving so fast, who knows? Neither of her parents would talk about it. They kept giving her a bunch of bull about still loving the kids, just needing change in their lives or new air or some other crap. Let me guess, this is your first Christmas with your parents separated? You got it. That sucks. Alex frowned. Big time. They rode in amiable silence and listened to Alex's country music. A half hour later, flurry started, and within a few minutes, the fine light snow changed into large, heavy flakes that whipped past the windshield. Here it comes. Alex slid his soda back in the cup holder and sat a little straighter as he focused through reduced visibility. Katie pulled her legs under her and watched the snow fly, glad the roads were still clear. It's about time we had a white Christmas. There was something exciting about a big snowfall. The last few years, heavy snows had been few and far between. But now the wind spun and snow wildly in sheets and waves like water in an angry sea. My brother Jason has got to be loving this. He'll have his plow rigged and ready to go. He's like a little kid when it comes to snow, Alex said. He drives a truck too? Alex tilted his head and the corner of his mouth lifted. His eyes sparkled as he grinned in a way she could only describe as sexy. Up north, everybody drives a truck. Katie liked this lighter side of Alex. He'd seemed polite but preoccupied earlier, especially after his phone call. Jason will be chomping at the bit to get out there and plow and pull cars out of the ditch. This is the best Christmas gift he could ask for. 
She bet Alex liked the snow just as much as his brother. What do you want for Christmas? He glanced at her and then back to the road. The snow began to accumulate. He huffed. Me? I want a new life. He raked a hand through his hair and stared at the swirling white stuff. Katie wondered, did he mean he couldn't wait to get married? He looked lost in his thoughts as he cruised on. He might want a new life, but more than anything, Katie wanted her old life back. New wasn't all it was cracked up to be. She wanted to spend the holidays and winter break in her old house, with both her parents and her little sister Nicole. No new people being forced upon her. The radio station crackled. Alex glanced over. Want to find a new station? Sure. She reached over his coat and backpack to adjust the dials. She noticed how good he smelled, like aftershave or maybe really good deodorant. You're not going to find much this far north. You might get a station out of Minocqua or Park Falls. Katie slowly rolled the knob of the old truck radio, listening for a break in the static. A few inches to her left, Alex's hand casually held the steering wheel. She noticed a few hairs on his long fingers. His nails were trimmed short. The cuff of his hoodie was worn on the edge and a little dirty. Go back. You passed something. Alex pointed with his index finger. She turned back and caught a radio station playing Christmas in Serifo by Trans-Siberian Orchestra. It was like a Christmas song on steroids. She figured Alex would like it too. Katie settled back in her seat. Alex cranked the volume and tapped his finger against the steering wheel as the music pumped through the speakers. I love these guys. They're so awesome. Have you ever seen them in concert? She asked. No, I didn't even know they toured. Every year they do a huge Christmas tour from November through early January. This is the first year since I was little that I haven't gone. She ignored the twist in her gut, reminding her that the simple family tradition was over forever. How come he didn't go this year? His head pulsed to the rock beat. She sighed. The breakup. That sucks. Yeah, it really does. Nothing's the same anymore. My mom is dragging me up to the middle of flipping nowhere. No offense. She peeked at him out of the corner of her eye. She didn't mean to diss his childhood home. Alex glanced over and smirked. None taken. Now I have to spend four days, including Christmas, with some guy I've never met. My mom doesn't even know what to call him. She says he's not her boyfriend. Alex raised an eyebrow. I know! Katie raised her hands in the air. What's with that? How stupid does she think I am? And then after that nightmare, I have to go to my dad's new place and celebrate Christmas with him, his new squeeze Marie, and her three little kids. Ouch. Alex cringed. What I wouldn't give to run away and skip this entire holiday. You and me both, he mumbled. The song ended and the DJ came on. That was Christmas in Sarajevo by Trans-Siberian Orchestra. Up next, we'll hear more holiday music, but first, a weather update. The entire northern region is under an official weather warning, and starting at 7 p.m. this evening, it will change over to blizzard conditions throughout the night and into tomorrow. Katie skimmed a quick glance at Alex. He listened intently, but didn't appear too worried. Expect high winds with estimated snowfall this evening of 6 to 10 inches and an additional overnight snowfall of 8 to 12 inches, ending by afternoon. Temperatures will drop creating wind chills in the negative numbers, along with significant blowing and drifting snow. Holy crap. I guess my mom was right for a change. Katie stared wide-eyed across the truck cab. A white Christmas was one thing. A full-out blizzard, another. So folks, if you don't have to go out, don't. And if you are out, get back home as soon as you can. This is the perfect time to snuggle in and enjoy a hot toddy and a white Christmas. And on that note, here's Bing Crosby. The string started playing and the crooning voice of Ben singing White Christmas floated through the cab. 
Good thing I put extra weight in the back of the truck last time I was home. It's going to take longer to get there than I thought. Katie twisted in her seat to see the two large utility buckets on each side of the truck bed, snow accumulated around them, and her canvas duffel bag. How much longer do you think? I'd say an hour, maybe an hour and a half. I should probably call my mom and give her an update. She fished the phone out of her purse and turned it on. The light pulsed repeatedly looking for a signal, but there was none. No service? Alex asked. None. I kind of figured that would happen. There's terrible tower service up here, and with the storm, the only thing that's going to work is a landline. Katie dropped the phone back in her bag, not sure if she was disappointed to be cut off from her mother or relieved. Well, that gets me off the hook listening to my mom nag about your driving, the current snow conditions, and if I flossed my teeth today. You can never floss enough, Alex teased. Katie tossed a Cheeto at him. Despite the fact he was driving, Alex caught the Cheeto and popped it in his mouth. He shot her a cocky grin. Katie smiled and shook her head. Chapter 3 Alex hadn't seen a winter storm this bad in years. The road conditions had changed from bad to barely visible, and for the last couple of miles, he only saw a few other cars on the road. The snow fell in a constant, thick blanket. The headlights illuminated the snow, and the flakes raced by at a warp speed like they were in a spaceship in a sci-fi movie. Why aren't the plows out? Katie asked from her side of the dark cab. They might be waiting until more snow accumulates, or maybe they haven't gotten to this road yet. Another huge gust hit the truck, causing Alex to grip the steering wheel tighter. The winds howled. Sometimes when there are high winds, the plows are pulled until conditions ease up. That seems like a bad idea. It does if you're stranded out in it. He focused on the road. Like us, she said. He detected the strain in her voice. Nothing to worry about. I'll get you there in one piece. He wanted to reach over and pat her leg in reassurance, but figured two hands on the wheel would be better. I'm holding you to that, she teased. He chuckled. No problem. In Ashland, we get huge lake effect snows off of Lake Superior. Trust me, I have a PhD in driving snow-covered roads. An hour later, they'd only covered 30 miles. Ice had accumulated under the windshield wipers. Even with the defroster on high, the icy buildup made it difficult to see the road. He glanced at Katie and found her gripping the armrest. Do you think we should pull over somewhere? She asked. Alex didn't want to admit defeat when they were so close, but the roads had definitely deteriorated. We've only got another 15 miles, and I think we can get there no problem. But it's going to take a while, unless a plow comes through and clears a path. In the distance, he spotted the fuzzy glow of lights at the side of the road. A minute later, they came upon a combination gas station slash convenience store. The station's bright overhead lights illuminated the snow-coated building. What do you say we pull over and see if they have a weather update? I'm good with that. Plus, after that jumbo soda, he could use the bathroom. Someone had plowed the station not that long ago, so the lot was much better than the actual highway. Alex turned into a parking spot in front of the store. The strong winds had drilled snow onto one side of the building and wiped it clean on another. Why don't you go first? Because if we both open our doors at the same time, the wind will blow everything right out of here, Alex said. Kate slipped into her coat and grabbed her purse. All set. She hopped out. The wind blew her hair straight back as she pushed her door closed and ran inside. Alex forced his door open. Piercing cold air took his breath away. He squinted to prevent the icy snow from stabbing his eyes and ran the few steps to the entry door. Phew! He shuddered and shook his head. Snow flew off his hair like a bad case of dandruff. Oh my god, it's freezing out there! Katie hugged herself from the cold as she headed to the restroom. 
Colored Christmas lights twinkled from the store windows, lighting up a display of chewing tobacco. The sales counter featured crowded displays of lighters, holiday hard candies, Amish fudge, and a dozen other impulse buys. An older guy, maybe in his 60s and wearing a red flannel shirt and glasses that reminded Alex of his grandpa, stood behind the counter. Red foil garland decorated the wall of cigarettes. It's pretty nasty driving out there, the man commented. Ugh, the last few miles have been the worst. Have you heard any updates? Alex asked. Here, take a look. The man placed a laptop on the counter and turned it Alex's direction. The radar showed a huge white blob of precipitation covering upper Wisconsin and extending back into Minnesota. When Alex checked radar this morning, the snowfall predictions were low. I thought the storm was supposed to be north of us. He stared at the white cloud that covered most of the monitor. Weathermen are no better today than they were 30 years ago. All that high-tech equipment, and they only predicted three inches of snow. Now they're saying 12 to 20 before this thing is done. Alex looked outside at the whiteout conditions. Seen any plows? We've only got 15 miles to go, and a plow sure would make life easier. Not for a while. Hard to say what they'll do with it being the holidays and all. Katie appeared wearing a disarming smile. She noticed the radar. Holy crud! Look at that! Alex held back his grin as she peered at the screen. Her glossy brown hair flowed over her shoulders. She turned her amber eyes on him. Her long, dark lashes waved. What do you think? Can we get through? That's what we were just talking about. If we don't try to get through now, I don't know when we will. This is only the front end of the storm. It's going to last for quite a while. Katie pursed her lips as she concentrated on the radar screen. If you don't want to drive anymore tonight, there's a small motel. The dew drop in, up the road a mile or so. The clerk gestured to the north. Alex preferred to drive through the snow and arrive tonight versus waiting until the snow stopped, but he felt he should hear Katie's thoughts too. What do you think? Do drop in or four-wheel drive? How far again? She asked, apparently considering the options. He wondered if she worried more about spending the night with him in a hotel room or not getting home to see her mom tonight. If it's really bad... 45 minutes, maybe an hour at the most. You realize you're going to have to stay the night. My mom will never let you keep driving in weather like this. You mean stay with, what did you call him, not the boyfriend? I don't know. On the other hand, if he got waylaid, he'd be able to postpone his breakup talk with Trina. A night at a cabin with a bunch of strangers wouldn't be all bad. Plus, Katie seemed pretty nice and low drama. Bright flashing lights appeared outside, followed by a huge snow plow. Look, there's a plow. Katie pointed out the window. And it's headed the right direction. What do you say, want to go for it? Alex asked, anxious to get back on the road. Totally. No guts, no glory. Katie's face lit up. She held up her hand and Alex high-fived her. Do you kids have emergency supplies in case you have trouble? The old clerk asked. Yeah, I've got sand in the back and a snow shovel. How about water and blankets? The clerk asked. I have half my wardrobe in my laundry bag, but I'll grab us a couple of waters. Don't worry, we'll be fine. We're not far from our destination, Alex explained. I'm sure you will be, but it never hurts to be prepared. He moved the laptop off the checkout counter. As Katie paid, Alex scanned the store racks for some last-minute Christmas gift for his fiance. She'd be pissed if he gave her a light-up pin with a Santa dressed in a Packers jersey. Fudge wouldn't be on her diet or a giant tin of popcorn. Once he broke off their engagement, she'd probably throw any gift he gave her back in his face anyway. He followed Katie out to the truck. The plow scraped off the top inches of snow off the roads. The going was still slow, but Alex felt satisfied he'd have Katie at her destination soon. He spotted their turn thanks to a light at the intersection. 
The good news is we found River Road. We're getting close, Alex said. And the bad news? He slowed to take the turn. River Road hasn't been plowed. The truck fishtailed as he took the corner. Whoa, don't do that. Katie gripped the dash. Sorry. Alex peered out at the deep, unmarred snow before them. Someone had driven by from the other direction not too long ago, and he used their tire treads to help guide the way. So where's the river? Katie peered into the darkness with nothing but snow flying all around. I don't know. I've never been this way before. It could be right next to us for all I know. I can barely see the road. He gripped the steering wheel and peered through the mesmerizing snow. At this rate, you're going to have to end up staying the night with me at Camp Dysfunctional. Ha! She taunted, sounding more nervous as they neared her destination. You'd like that, wouldn't you? To make me suffer alongside you. He might not mind staying at her place. The closer he got to home, the more he dreaded the task ahead. Anything to save me from facing mom and not the boyfriend alone. I feel like I'm going to death row, not celebrating Christmas. How messed up is that? Pretty messed up. But isn't that what the holidays are about? Forcing families to spend time together so they can be reminded how odd everyone is? That's how he felt about Trina. She used to be pretty and fun, but now she stood out in ways that weren't good. Interesting theory. I always thought my family was pretty normal, but now that you mention it, I have my Aunt Liz. She giggled. What? He glanced over to see her laughing face illuminated by the lights from the dashboard. Whenever Aunt Liz hosted Christmas, during dessert she'd bring out this old jug filled with what looked like dark, grimy apple juice. You see, after my great-grandpa died, they found three jugs in the cellar from when he made moonshine. Aunt Liz would set up little shot glasses and pour for anyone who wanted a shot. A couple hits of great-grandpa's juice and they were wasted. It's pretty hysterical. Alex had seen his parents tipsy a few times and joined them on a couple of occasions, too. Have you ever tried any of your grandpa's moonshine? Once I took a sip. It tasted like pond scum. I thought for sure it was going to burn through my stomach wall. Not much of a drinker? Not really. I've been to a few parties at school, but everyone gets drunk so fast. It's fun at the time, but the next day is so horrible. I swear I'll never drink again. Until the next party, Alex added. Exactly. Katie reminded him of his freshman year and all the hell raising he did. Oh, Aunt Liz likes to strip. Katie giggled again. Seriously? Alex wished he wasn't stuck driving through a blizzard. He'd rather focus on Katie. Did she know how her face lit up as she recalled old memories? Erase whatever visual you're thinking of, because you're wrong. Aunt Liz is a very large 50-year-old woman. She sings loud, crude songs and pretends she's a size 2 Vegas showgirl, Katie said. Alex laughed and smiled at Katie. She grinned and shrugged, then looked forward. Look out! She yelled. He snapped his head forward. A deer stood in the middle of the road, staring transfixed at the headlights. The truck careened forward. Shit! He slammed on the brakes. Unable to get any traction, the truck slid, turning sideways. The four-wheel drive was useless in the deep snow. Alex turned the steering wheel to keep the tires pointed forward. He laid on the horn. The deer bolted. He struggled to get the truck under control. A second deer ran across their path. This one wasn't so lucky. Alex had no choice. The truck clipped the deer's hindquarter and sent them spinning. The truck turned like a tilt-a-whirl, and with the heavy snow falling, he had no idea which direction was forward, or if they were about to hit a tree. Hang on! The truck careened off the road, back end first, then turned sideways. He felt sure the truck would flip. He thrust his right arm out to hold Katie in place. Each nanosecond passed in slow motion. The truck bounced down a steep embankment, turning forward and finally sliding to a halt. 
Then Katie screamed like he'd never heard anyone scream before. The headlights revealed rushing water splashing at the front of the truck. They were in the river. Chapter 4 Oh, crap! Alex tried to scramble backward in his seat to avoid the dark, angry water engulfing his truck, but his seatbelt held him in place. The river is going to pull us in! Katie yelled in panic. Alex looked around frantically. The front end of the truck was clearly in the water. Would the whole truck slide in? Was Katie right that the force of the strong current would pull them in further? We have to get out! Katie nearly cried. Let me try putting it in reverse. Maybe it'll get us out of the water a little. No! Don't touch anything. It'll suck us in. Adrenaline pumped through Alex. He had to move quickly. He gingerly put the truck into reverse and stepped lightly on the gas. The truck lurched backward for a second, but then slid back into place. He glanced at Katie, her face terrified, her hand gripping the truck door her other planted firmly on the dash. He tried one more time, giving it more gas. The truck rocked back a fraction and then slipped forward again. Stop, stop, stop. Please don't do that anymore. You're going to rock us further into the river. Okay. Alex put the truck into park and placed the brake, hoping it would hold them in place. With a sigh, he turned off the ignition. We've got to get out of here. He scanned the truck for the best solution. It's going to have to be either by the door, which is close to the water, or the cab window. I'm not sure I can fit through that. I don't want to be stuck in that tiny window if the river suddenly pulls us in, Katie said. Alex couldn't stop staring at the water as it raced by. He opened his door a few inches. A rush of cold wind blew in. The water at my door is only a few inches deep. He yanked the door shut and turned to Katie. Put on all your winter stuff and let's get out of here while we can. He quickly slipped on his coat, hat, and gloves. Katie looked ready, except for frantically pulling items out of her shopping bag and stuffing them into the pockets of her coat. What are you doing? Alex asked in disbelief. I'm taking as many of the gifts as possible. You've got to be kidding me. If your truck gets washed away, I'm not losing all my stuff. Alex reached past her legs to the glove box. Excuse me. He popped it open and grabbed a flashlight and slammed it shut. Good idea. Katie stuffed a couple long, narrow bags of bread down the front of her coat and zipped it tight. You planned on giving someone bread for Christmas? He slid the flashlight in his backpack and pulled one strap over his shoulder. It's a family tradition. My grandpa used to have a bakery. Plus, we might need it later. Good point. Now let's get the hell out of here. Alex unhooked his seatbelt and balanced himself between the seat and the steering wheel. He glanced at Katie and the fear in her eyes. He attempted a brave look. Here we go. Katie unbuckled and stood awkwardly in the tilted truck cab. Her heart nearly pounded out of her body. Alex opened the door. Cold wind blustered in. He held tight to the truck as he stepped down. Katie noticed he wore boots. Smart guy. She instantly regretted her poor choice of shoes. With her backpack containing her laptop strapped in her back, she scooched to the driver's side door. No way was she letting Alex out of her sight. He stepped out and stumbled to his knees. He stood and held onto the truck for support as he managed to move a few feet away from the door. He held out his hand. The rocks are covered in solid ice. Hold onto the truck as you step down and then take my hand. He hollered over the wind. Katie looked out at the dark, churning water. They might have drowned if they slid further in. The cold, biting wind threatened to push her back into the truck. She gripped the truck door with one hand and the hanging seatbelt strap with the other. Katie stepped down and broke through thin ice into glacial water that instantly soaked her shoe. She planted her other foot further away, in several inches of snow. 
Good job. You've got it. He kept his hand outstretched, his face encouraging. Katie let go of the seatbelt straps and took a large step toward Alex. She almost reached him. Then her foot slipped and she fell. Hard. Her leg slid under the truck into the icy water. Katie! Alex yelled, scrambling over the slick rocks. Stunned, it took her a second to realize what just happened. Freezing cold water soaked her legs and seeped up the front of her coat. Her elbow hurt like heck. Katie, are you okay? Alex appeared at her side. Yeah, she said, startled to find herself in the water. Alex's hand slid under her arms and pulled her out. I've got ya. He lifted her to her feet and leaned her against the truck. The wind and snow whipped around them. He moved close to her face. You're going to be okay, got it? She nodded, absorbing the affirmation in his eyes. Cold river water dripped down her legs. Good. Stay close to me. We're going to get back up to the road. Katie balanced herself against the side of the truck as they eased their way over the worst of the large rocks. Alex led them up the steep embankment, pausing often to help her. Beneath several inches of accumulated snow, dried weeds helped secure her footing. She still slipped and fell a couple of times, and her wet jeans were quickly coated with snow. At the top of the embankment, they looked down at the truck. Both front tires rested in the river. Thank God they were safely away from the terrifying water, but Katie didn't like the odds of being out in a blizzard either. Shivering, she turned to Alex. We're in big trouble. That's an understatement. He zipped his coat all the way up and tugged it higher to cover his ears. Katie hugged herself in a failed attempt to stay warm. Her legs were numb. She fought to stand straight against the blowing wind her coat no longer a barrier to the cold. How are you doing? You okay? Alex checked her over, his brows lowered in thought. Other than freezing to death, I'm f -f -f fine. Her teeth chattered. Concern clouded his eyes. He reached for her scarf, the red one she got last Christmas. He rewrapped it around her neck, this time covering her mouth and nose. We've got to hope someone comes by really soon or find some shelter, and fast. He tucked the ends of the scarf in snug. Which direction should we go? She wanted out of this cold as fast as possible. We didn't pass anything for a while on this road, so let's keep moving forward. Alex hitched his backpack higher and started off, bracing his body against the strong wind. Katie trudged behind. She appreciated Alex trying to serve as a windbreak, but it didn't seem to make much difference. Within minutes, her jeans were frozen, the icy fabric rubbing against her skin like sandpaper. The biting snow hit her face like tiny needles. She tugged her scarf higher so it all but covered her eyes. She wished she had a hat. Each step became agony as they pushed forward. Katie could no longer feel her toes, and her feet felt like they would break off with her next step. Her fingers turned into frozen sticks. The cold seeped into every pore. If they didn't find shelter soon, she was in danger of frostbite or hypothermia. After what felt like an hour of walking, but may have only been ten minutes, Alex stopped. Katie walked right into him. Sorry, she mumbled. Alex turned to her, his face red from the fierce wind. He tucked his hands under his arms and yelled over the howling wind. How are you holding up? Katie wiped frozen snot off her nose. I'm really cold. Do you see anything? Her teeth still chattered. No, only trees on this side. The other side is the river. There's got to be a driveway to a cabin or house eventually. You usually can't go two minutes without running into a fishing cabin or summer cottage in this area. Maybe they should have stayed in the truck. She couldn't believe she was actually entertaining that thought. The truck might be washed into the river by now, but at least in the truck, they could have run the engine to stay warm. Do you know how to build an igloo? She joked, but really meant it. 
I wish I did. We've got to get you out of the cold and soon. The wind howled through the trees that lined the left side of the road. Let's go. I'm afraid if I stop for too long, I won't be able to keep going, she said. Alex put his arm around her and pulled her close, practically holding her upright. She tucked her body into his, which helped block some of the wind. They trudged forward like dazed zombies through the deepening snow, praying for a break in the tree line that would indicate a driveway. A few minutes later, when her backpack felt like the weight of the world, Alex pointed. What's that? Katie squinted and spied a shadow of something at the side of the road. A few steps later, her heart leapt. A mailbox! Chapter 5 Sure enough, a thin break in the trees revealed a narrow driveway that wound out of sight. Thoughts of freezing to death disappeared. Instead, Katie pictured a roaring fire, hot chocolate, and a big dinner. They picked up their pace and followed the path that would lead to salvation. She hoped. The snow here piled higher. It appeared that no one had plowed this driveway all season. So instead of dealing only with today's storm, they had all the snowfall to date slowing their progress. Even with Alex forging the way and creating a trail, Katie still had to lift her legs high to get through. Each step became torture as her frozen jeans rubbed her legs raw. She grit her teeth and pushed on. There it is! Alex yelled with renewed energy. Katie paused to catch her breath, spying the distant cabin. Thank God! She didn't know how much longer she could go on. Ahead, in a small clearing, nestled a quaint log cabin coated in snow like a gingerbread house with frosting dripping off the side. The only thing that took away from its storybook quality was the lack of smoke streaming from the chimney and an absence of light glowing warmly from within. Katie noticed a shed with a long row of snow-covered firewood lining one side. They dragged themselves through the deep snow to the cabin door. Any chance they left the door unlocked for us? She yelled over the whistling wind. Alex pushed snow out from in front of the screen door with his boot. I doubt we could be so lucky. He pulled on the screen door until he wedged it open far enough to reach the doorknob. Locked. Katie sighed. She wanted out of the elements. Now. I'll have to break a window. Alex left the front door and walked around the cabin. What are you doing? Katie followed him back into the deep snow. I'd rather break a window in a bedroom and not the main part of the cabin. It will be hard to keep the wind and snow out once we break in. Katie nodded, hugging herself, thankful to be with such a smart, resourceful guy. They struggled around the perimeter trying to figure which window might be a bedroom. The first window Alex peered in looked like a kitchen. A couple of large windows indicated a main room that probably looked out over a scenic view. But whatever the view might be on a sunny day, it was obliterated by the darkness and blowing snow. They reached the other side and discovered two smaller windows. I think this is our best shot, Alex said. The bottom edge of the window was about four feet off the ground, and even with the snow, it didn't give them much advantage. Katie noticed a screen covering the window. How are we going to get past the screen? Have you got a jackknife on you? Alex grinned, and despite his chafe red face and their horrible circumstances, she couldn't help but grin back. Even covered in snow and practically freezing to death, Alex looked sexy as hell. Sure, right here with my thermos of hot chocolate and hand warmers. She must be hallucinating from the cold. Why else would she be thinking about his good looks at a time like this? Alex slipped off a glove and fished in his pocket. He pulled out his car keys. He handed her his glove to hold and ran the key over the screen, his hands shaking from the cold. The key created a dent in the old metal, but didn't break through. He ran it over the side of the screen where the mesh attached to the frame, but no luck. He glanced at Katie. She saw his determination. He repositioned the keys in his hand, and she knew how frozen his fingers must feel. He jabbed the key straight at the screen instead of at an angle and punctured through. He dragged the key down hard. 
the metal ripped. He made a four-inch tear and shoved the keys back in his pockets. He slipped his fingers through the gap he made and yanked hard on the screen, creating a larger and larger opening. Thank God. Alex brought his bare hand to his mouth and blew warm air on it. Here, you want to put your glove back on? He nodded, his face red, and slipped his hand in. Then he tore away the screen exposing the window. Stand back. I'm going to try and break it with my shoulder. That sounds dangerous. You could get cut really bad. Have any better ideas? See any bricks laying around? He scanned the area. No, but I saw a wood pile back by the shed. Maybe a piece of wood will work. Alex nodded. I'll go get a piece. She turned to fetch the wood. Alex grabbed her arm and stopped her. No, you can barely stand. I'll get it. Wait here. He literally leaned her up against the side of the cabin and disappeared around the corner. She didn't argue. Her feet felt like lead, and her body was so cold she could barely move. A couple minutes later, Alex returned with a piece of wood. You better stand back, just in case glass flies everywhere. He gripped the wood in his gloved hands and tapped it firm against the window. Nothing. He hit it again, harder, creating a crack. Then he swung back hard and nailed it. The glass shattered. He ran the wood over the inside edges of the window frame to knock the jagged glass away. He brushed stray shards off the side and turned to Katie. We're sleeping inside tonight. She sighed in relief, thankful to finally find a safe haven. I'll climb in and come around to the door. That was fine with her. She didn't know if she could navigate her stiff, frozen limbs through the window. Alex brushed the edge of the sill again, put his gloved hands on it, and jumped up. He ducked his head and disappeared inside, his legs scraping the edge as he went. Katie held her breath, praying he was okay. A couple seconds later, he popped up, looking happier than he had the whole trip. Go around to the back door. I'll meet you there. She picked up the piece of firewood and hugged it hurrying the best she could to the door. For an instant, she panicked, afraid he wouldn't be there to let her in, that she'd be stuck outside. But her fears proved false as the door flew open, and Alex reached forward to help her in. He closed the door after her, blocking out the frigid winds. She sighed, so exhausted and cold from their trek. She looked around the dark room, stunned at the quiet of the cabin compared to outside. They stood in a kitchen with a counter jutting out, the shadows of furniture loomed in the space beyond. Alex removed his gloves and rubbed his hands together. Oh, I'm so cold my fingers could fall off. I don't think I'll ever feel warm again. Oh, here. I figured we'd need this. She set the piece of firewood on the counter. Her backpack and purse followed. Alex fumbled in his coat pockets and pulled out the flashlight. Let's get a look around and see what we've got. There's no electricity, I checked. Either the owner turned it off when he left, or the storm knocked down the power lines. He directed the light slowly around the cabin, revealing a tiny kitchen that opened up into a main living area. A big old brown couch anchored the room with a log coffee table on a large braided rug in front of a fieldstone fireplace. Bingo! Alex turned to her, his voice so bright that she could picture his great smile. Thank goodness. They examined the fireplace closer and found a poker and brush in a stand, a basket of old newspapers, and on the mantel, an old kerosene lamp. She wondered if it was a decorative antique or something they could actually use. She found a couple of framed pictures, most likely the owners whose home they just busted into, and a large box of stick matches. Let's start a fire right away. Katie couldn't keep the urgency out of her voice. She moved to the kitchen to grab the chunk of wood. Her jeans felt like hard cardboard against her frozen skin. Alex kneeled before the hearth with the chain curtain open, crumbling newspaper. Here, take the flashlight and see if there's any wood stacked over there. Katie aimed the beam at the other side of the fireplace and discovered a metal pail with wood. She lugged it over. There's only three pieces. Thanks. That'll be enough to get a fire started. I'll get more wood in a few minutes. I can fetch some now. 
she offered. No, you need to get warm. You're shivering. Katie resisted the urge to hug him. She really didn't want to go back outside. Thanks. While he organized the newspaper and wood, she pointed the flashlight beam at the fireplace. He struck a match and lit the edges of the paper. There you go. Burn, baby, burn. The tiny flames quickly spread, catching more paper on fire. Katie moved closer, longing for warmth. Within a minute, the paper engulfed into flames. But a few seconds later, smoke poured into the room. Chapter 6 Katie coughed and backed away. Oh shit, I forgot to open the flu. He reached into the fireplace. The what? She waved through the smoke that billowed from the fireplace. The flu. The damper. It's kept closed to keep air out when the fireplace isn't in use. He fiddled underneath and coughed. Eventually, the smoke stopped snaking into the room and trailed up the chimney instead. There, that should do it. Katie knelt next to Alex to watch the small flames as they devoured the newspaper and caught on the corners of the wood. They held their hands close to the growing fire. Katie let a whisper of heat touch her fingers. Now that's what I'm talking about. Alex glanced at her and smiled. What? She asked. Nothing. You make me laugh. It doesn't take much to make you happy, does it? She wrinkled her forehead. Like surviving a near-death experience? I wasn't going to let you die. You were always safe with me. He nudged her with his shoulder. Yeah, until you drove your truck into a river and made me walk ten miles through a blizzard in wet clothes, which, by the way, are now frozen solid. She arched an eyebrow. <laughs> My bad, he chuckled. Just for that, I'll bring in more firewood. Don't you want to wait and warm up a little first? No, I'd rather stock up now and not have to go back out for a while. He grabbed his gloves and disappeared back outside into the cold abyss. Katie wiped her nose on her sleeve as she was out of tissues. She cleared the area next to the fireplace to make space for the wood. Even though she still couldn't stop shivering, she unzipped her coat and pulled out the slightly bent sourdough bread. Luckily, it didn't appear to be wet. They'd be eating it soon. The door flew open. Along with a frigid gust of wind and snow, Alex brought in an enormous pile of wood. He wasn't kidding when he said he was stocking up. Over here, I cleared a spot. He crossed the room and eased the pile onto the stone hearth and went out for more. She stacked the wood in a neat pile and tossed two more pieces on the fire to make sure their precious heat source didn't extinguish. Alex brought in two more loads, and in between organizing the wood and thawing herself by the fire, Katie moved her belongings to the side of the couch. That ought to hold us for a while. He lowered the last of the wood to the floor and then stood in front of the open flames. Great job. It actually feels warmer in here. She shivered from the cold wetness of her thawing jeans. Alex noticed. You need to find some dry clothes. We both do. Snow covered his jeans well past his knees from tromping through the drifts. There might be some clothes in that back bedroom. I'll take a look. She grabbed the flashlight and opened the bedroom door. A cold blast blew. The freezing room sucked away any warmth she'd managed to coax back into her body. Broken window glass covered the floor, and snow dusted the small room. The owners were not going to be happy, but she and Alex had no choice. It was break in or die. She knew her parents would pay for the damages. Then she thought of her mom and how worried she must be and how much more worried she'd be when they failed to show up. Katie never gave her mom Alex's number, so she couldn't try to contact them either. She opened the top drawer of the dresser to find miscellaneous items, like sunglasses, binoculars, and a book on fishing. The next drawer contained a few t-shirts, some socks, and one very large pair of boxers. But the bottom drawer held the mother load. She grabbed a few items and brought them to the living room, where Alex sat by the fire with his coat open. I found some pajama pants and a pair of sweats. 
along with the couple flannel shirts and what looks like hunting socks. I think our host is into shooting things. And fishing, too. Alex held up the flannel pajama pants patterned with various types of fish. Let's hope these were a joke Christmas gift and not this dude's real taste in clothes. I'm taking the sweats. Katie snatched them off the pile before Alex could. Fine. I'm a Pisces. I'll do the fish flannels proud. He held them up, admiring the various fish. The bedroom is a mess with broken glass and snow. I wonder if we should try to clean it up and block the window. Maybe we could push the dresser in front of it to keep some of the snow out. I'll go do it. He tossed the wild fish pants on the coffee table. I'll help. She sniffed back her runny nose. Why don't you change while I take care of it? I don't mind. Thanks. Katie wished she were more help. So far, all she'd done was stack wood. Alex disappeared, and she eased out of her frozen shoes, leaving them by the door. Her feet were so cold and stiff, they hurt. She eased her jeans down her thighs. Her skin felt frozen deep into her bones. She'd need a hot shower or a jacuzzi to warm them up. What she wouldn't give for a hot beverage. She stepped into the sweats. The soft, cold fabric slid against her legs. Even at her above average height, the sweats were too long. She pulled the drawstring in, tied it snug, then rolled the waistband over several times. Katie sat on the fireplace ledge and covered her frozen feet with the thick socks. Better. She took off her coat so the heat from the fire could warm her faster and pulled up a chair and hung her pants over it to dry. Katie laughed at herself because she'd seen people do exactly the same thing in the movies. Are you decent? Alex called from around the corner. She smiled. The coast is clear. You'll see no moon tonight. Damn, I love a full moon. He came around the corner with his arms full of blankets. Was he flirting? Or maybe he had hypothermia and was delusional. I figured we should grab whatever we need out of the bedroom before snow fills the room. I brought the blankets and pillows off the bed. Good idea. I'll go check out the bathroom for anything useful while you change. She took the flashlight and left him alone. The bathroom was a tiny room with a shower stall, sink, and toilet. She tried the water, but it didn't work. No surprise. The owners would have turned the water off to keep the pipes from freezing. She hugged herself in the cold little room. The medicine cabinet held the usual. Soap, extra razors, pain reliever, band-aids, a bottle of Viagra. She put the bottle back, safe in the knowledge they wouldn't need any little pills. Underneath the sink, she found extra toilet paper, paper towels, a can of cleanser, and a plunger. The drawer was much better. She found a box of tissues and a votive candle. She grabbed a tissue and blew her nose. Ever since they arrived, she'd been wiping her nose on her sleeve when Alex wasn't looking. She gathered her small booty, about to ask Alex if he was ready. As soon as she stepped into the small hallway, frigid air blew from under the bedroom door. She backtracked and grabbed the bathroom rug, rolled it up, and pushed it against the bedroom door. That ought to help keep out the cold. Ready or not, here I come, she called to Alex. She secretly hoped he might not be ready. With a face like his, his body promised to be damn good looking too. She stepped around the corner. To her disappointment, he was fully clothed. Don't you look fine, she snickered at Alex, modeling the yellow pajama pants with green fish. The fact was, he did look fine, even with his hair messed up from wearing a hat. He wore a gray t-shirt that hugged him so nicely that she chewed her lower lip. Either he worked out a lot, or he naturally had a kick-ass body. Not just any man can pull off pants like these. He posed, offering his best blue steel pose. She laughed. No, they definitely cannot. She noticed his clothes lay over a chair next to hers and thought they looked like a little match set. A couple. Which they weren't. He was engaged, and she was only a stranger he had offered a ride. I found a candle. 
she set it on the coffee table and joined Alex next to the roaring fire. Finally, the room began to warm. Katie faced the fire, letting the heat penetrate her legs. They still felt like cold marble. After a minute, she turned around to warm her backside. Alex reached for the poker to adjust the wood. She noticed a red smudge on his wrist. Are you bleeding? What? Where? He paused, looking down at his arms, but not turning his hands over. Your wrist. Here, let me see. Katie reached for his right hand. She removed the poker from his grip, set it on the knotted rug, and examined his wrist. His hand was large and still cool to the touch. Oh my gosh, you cut yourself. I did? He leaned down to get a look at the dried blood on the side of his wrist, but he let her hold his hand. Look at that. I noticed my wrist stinging earlier, but I didn't put it together. It must have happened when I crawled through the window. Katie took his hand in hers. We need to clean that up. You should get a tetanus shot. Sit down so I can get a closer look. Chapter 7 I think I'm going to have a little trouble getting that tetanus shot anytime soon. Alex sat close to Katie on the warm hearth and his leg brushed hers. He noticed that she didn't pull away. She ducked her head, examining his wrist. The cut didn't look like much of anything, but if a beautiful girl wanted to fuss over him, he sure wouldn't complain. After the scare of the truck nearly sliding into the river and then Katie falling into the icy water, he'd almost suffered a heart attack. Being tended to was a nice change of pace. I can't tell if there's any glass in it. We need some water to clean away the blood. If you want water, we'll have to melt some, which we need to do for drinking anyway. Oh, wait, I've got a water bottle in my backpack. Aren't you glad I brought it now? Katie popped up to fetch the water. He bit back his smirk, entertained at how intent she was over a little scratch. Very glad. She returned with the water bottle. I won't be able to see anything if we do this over the sink, and I really don't want to pour water on the floor. Let me grab a towel. He watched as she disappeared into the bathroom and then the kitchen, rummaging through a couple of drawers before returning. Okay, ready. Why don't you sit here on the coffee table? Then I can see in the firelight. Whatever you say, doctor. Alex moved to the coffee table as Katie set her items between them. You'll thank me later. You don't want to end up with blood poisoning or lockjaw. He fought back his laughter over her extreme concern. No, ma'am, I don't. Katie pulled his hand over the bowl and uncapped the bottle. She raised an eyebrow. I know you're laughing at me. I'm sorry, he apologized trying to be serious. No, you're not. She bit back a smile, and he saw laughter in her eyes. Alex felt a kick in the heart that he hadn't felt with Trina in forever. Katie poured water over his wrist and dabbed the cut with a damp tissue. Then she put a little soap in her hand and gently massaged his wrist area, carefully rubbing the lather over his cut. The sting almost made him flinch, but he refused to let Katie think he was less than invincible. As she concentrated, her dark hair draped forward like a silky curtain he wanted to touch. She held his hand captive with her soft, delicate fingers, and he found himself breathing heavier than normal. She poured more cool water to wash away the soap, then dried it with a white kitchen towel and placed a Band-Aid over the cut. There. That should do the trick. Any more cuts you want to tell me about? She glanced up, still in doctor mode. The light from the fire danced in her eyes. None that I know of. Let's see your other hand. He offered it freely. She turned it over and then looked closer at his fingernails. What's this? Blood on your fingernails? There is? He pulled back his hand. Sure enough, he discovered dried blood under his nails. I wonder how that got there. Katie examined him with renewed interest, checking each of his arms, then studying his neck and face. Turn your head the other direction, she instructed. He obeyed. 
You have a cut on your cheekbone close to your hairline. You've been scratching it. Her voice sounded close to his ear, giving him an unexpected tingle up his spine. She picked up the dish towel and a water bottle. Scoop closer so I can see it better. I kind of landed face first when I fell through the window. He inched forward and leaned his face closer to Katie. This gives whole new meaning to turn the other cheek. Katie chuckled and leaned in to examine the cut. She swept her hair over her shoulder and dabbed at his wound with the moist cloth. Her breath warmed his cheek. With her finger, she brushed his hair away from the injury. Her touch tickled. It doesn't look that bad. She gave the cut a final dab, and he accidentally flinched. Come on, that couldn't have hurt, she said. What can I say? I'm a sensitive guy. With their heads close, he held her gaze and noticed bright flecks in her eyes. A few seconds later, she glanced away. A rosy blush colored her face. Just try not to touch it anymore. She hesitated before gathering up her things and retreating to the kitchen. Whatever you say, boss, he called after her. If he had to be stranded, this wasn't a half bad way to do it. I'm going to check the cupboards to see if there's anything to eat, Katie said from the kitchen. Go for it. Do you see any pots or pans I can use to melt snow in? Somebody used up our only good drinking water. He raised an accusatory brow at her. Katie stuck her tongue out and slapped a couple large pots onto the counter. Alex pulled on his coat and slipped into his wet boots. Thanks. He offered as he passed by in a better mood than he'd been all day and scooped up the pots. By the time he returned with the pots of snow, a candle flickered on the counter and Katie displayed a variety of cans and jars. She rushed to push the door shut. Alex kicked off his boots, set the pots near the fire, and added more wood to the flames. Well, the choices aren't great, but considering the situation, I think we'll survive, Katie said. What did you find? He dumped his coat on the chair and joined her. Several cans of baked beans, a can of tuna, two cans of tomato soup, creamed corn. Alex looked at the can with disgust. I'd rather starve than eat that goop. No kidding. It gets worse. Pea soup. She wrinkled her face as she held up the can. The good news is we've got grape jelly, crackers, pancake mix, and last but not least, beef stew. Not to be confused with canned dog food. He picked up the crackers, and as he feared, the edge had been chewed open. He held them out to Katie. You might want to pass on the crackers. Oh, gross. And I wanted to put tuna on them. You still can, but you might get a few mice droppings in the deal. He waved them closer. Katie shrieked and jumped away. Get that out of here. We could use the crackers to trap the mice and cook them over the fire. Oh, my God. Stop talking. That is disgusting. There better not be any mice in here. Or what? He laughed. Or I'll be out that door and on my way back to your truck. You wouldn't get ten feet and you'd be back here. Don't worry. I'll protect you if we see any killer mice. You'd better. Katie spied around the cabin in search of mice. So what's for dinner? I'm getting really hungry. I thought I'd be home by now enjoying a big plate of spaghetti and garlic bread. Alex's mom always cooked spaghetti his first night home from school. He hated to miss it. That sounds delicious. I don't know what I was supposed to be having tonight, but I'm sure it would have been a better spread than this. Do you think our parents are really worried about us? She picked up the tuna. He frowned. Yeah, I'm sure that by now your mother called the authorities to report us missing. He wondered how long until his parents started to worry. My mom must be freaking out. I feel kind of bad for snapping at her earlier. I didn't want to spend Christmas with her and not the boyfriend. She rolled the thin can on the counter. Looks like your wish might come true. And his too. 
He'd been dreading seeing Trina and having to break her heart. She wasn't a horrible girl, but she was the wrong girl. You don't think we'll get out of here before Christmas? Katie asked. He wasn't sure if she was relieved or not. Hard to say. The guy at the gas station said the storm is supposed to rage all night, and when the snow ends, the winds pick up. I think we're going to be here for a day at least, maybe two. We might as well set up camp and hunker down. Katie smirked. Did you just say hunker? Yeah. You have a problem with that? He placed both hands on the counter and leaned toward her. I've never heard a guy, let alone a tall, you know, a guy like you. She waved her hands in the air around him. Say hunker. She giggled. He laughed. And now you have. So in the process of hunkering down, I'm thinking beef stew would taste great right now. He grabbed the beef stew can, tossed it in the air, and caught it. Katie grinned. Okay, and we can slice up some of the sourdough bread I brought. She pulled one of the loaves out of the paper sleeve and checked it over. It's kind of squished, but at least it's dry. Squished bread is better than no bread, he said. They worked side by side preparing their dinner. Before long, a covered saucepan rested on the edge of the fire. The aroma of beef stew soon filled the air. Alex's stomach growled. Katie brought over some sliced sourdough wrapped in foil and placed it on the edge of the flames where it would be warm but not burn. A few minutes later, they nestled before the fire, each with a steaming bowl of stew and warm bread. It's not half bad. Katie dipped her bread in the stew and took a bite without missing a drop. Outside, the wind howled, reminding Alex how lucky they were to find the cabin. Being hungry definitely helps the taste. Another gust pushed against the windows. Cool air drafted in, preventing the cabin from holding much warmth except the area near the fireplace. Listen to that wind. I'm so glad we aren't out there anymore. Katie stared out the window, mesmerized by the snow swirling past. By the way, thank you for getting us safely inside here. I can't imagine being stuck out in the storm. She rested her caramel-colored eyes on him. You don't have to thank me. I almost gave you hypothermia. If I had slowed down or stopped when we had the chance, this never would have happened. Alex shoveled another spoonful of stew in his mouth to keep from admitting he'd scared the heck out of himself. There were moments he wasn't sure if he'd get her inside and warm up quickly enough. He knew how dangerous it was to be out in the elements. He had no right to feel protective of Katie, but he couldn't help but feel drawn to her. It's actually pretty fun. I mean, now that I know we're both okay, Katie said. Plus, if I can't have my traditional family Christmas at home in Madison... This is a much better alternative than what I was headed to. I just feel bad about you not getting home to see your family and your fiancé. That's gotta suck. It must be really hard to be away from her. Not as hard as you think. Nah, it's fine. You want some more water? He said to change the subject. Sure. She passed her glass and he filled it. They transferred the melted water from the pot into a pitcher and then added more snow to the pot so that they would always have more water. Katie set her bowl aside and fetched her purse. The one thing I feel bad about is my mom. She must be going insane. She checked her cell phone. No signal. She dropped it back into her bag. I know. It's a crummy time to go missing, right before Christmas. Anyone else you need to reach? No, not really. My dad's busy with his new squeeze. There's no boyfriend you need to get a hold of? He tried to say it like it was an afterthought and not a direct question he'd been itching to ask. She picked up her bowl. Not even close. Alex brightened. Really? I'd think a girl like you would have all kinds of guys hanging around. Katie's forehead wrinkled. What do you mean, a girl like me? You know, funny, outgoing, and pretty. 
Katie blushed, and he smiled at how sweet and clueless she seemed about herself. I don't know what Kool-Aid you've been drinking, but I'm not going to complain. She took another bite. So why don't you have a boyfriend? She dipped bread in the bowl. First off, I'm not looking for a boyfriend. I really want to do well at school, and having a boyfriend would be a distraction. Plus, I figure that if it's supposed to happen, it will. She stretched out her long legs. And second, most of the guys at school are idiots. She glanced at him with an impish smile. Oh, really? That's not true. There are lots of nice guys, but the only thing most of them want to do is go out, get loaded, and hook up with some random girl. That's not me. There was a guy across the hall I really liked. I thought he liked me too, but then he slept with my roommate. Katie deserved better than those freshman assholes. Ouch. That sucks. I'm afraid that's freshman year for you. Everyone gets to college and wants to do all the things they could never get away with at home. I spent most of my first semester drunk. Ah, you're a party boy. He read the judgment on her face. Not anymore. He laughed. I paid my dues big time. After almost flunking two of my classes, I decided to clean up my act or be sent home, which is the last thing I wanted. You must have been popular with the ladies. She scraped her bowl clean and set it aside. No, I wasn't. He laughed. I was the perfect boyfriend to Trina. I got plowed every Thursday to Sunday, but I never cheated on her. Ever. You must love her very much to want to get married this young. He really didn't want to talk about his doomed relationship. Things had been over for a long time, but Trina wouldn't accept it and let him go. That's a whole other story that I'd rather not go into tonight. Trina had changed. A lot. She manipulated people to get what she wanted in life. He couldn't be with a girl like that. Oh, okay, she said, sounding chastised, and he felt a little bad. She didn't know about his problems with Trina. He still needed to figure out how to get Trina to understand that they would not, under any circumstance, get married. Katie yawned and covered her mouth. The long day had finally caught up with her. Sorry, the fire must be making me tired. That, or the fact you had a near-death experience, fell into a river, and walked two miles in a blizzard. Alex teased, and then smiled in the sweetest of ways that showed off his dimples. Trina was one lucky girl. Katie wished she had a chance with Alex. She instantly scolded herself. Wasn't it some sort of sin to lust after someone else's boyfriend? What time is it anyway, do you know? Alex checked his watch. Quarter after 12. It's officially December 24th, Christmas Eve. It is late. No wonder I'm so tired. She looked around the room, wondering how they were going to handle the sleeping arrangements. They sure couldn't use the bedroom with the gaping window. Alex must have read her thoughts, or at least noticed the uncertainty on her face. Let's move the coffee table out of the way. You can sleep on the couch, and I'll take the floor. Katie knew she should offer him the couch, but she ached all over, and sleeping on the cold floor sounded horrible. Are you sure? I feel terrible making you sleep on the floor. But the couch wouldn't hold two people unless they were twisted together like red licorice. It's fine. Unless... He eyed the brown sofa with the leaf pattern upholstery. He lifted the center cushion. It's a hide-a-bed! He removed the other cushions to reveal a handle and mattress hidden within. He turned to Katie with a naughty smile and asked, Want to sleep with me? Chapter 8 For a second, Katie thought he meant something more, but then saw the devilish twinkle in his eye and realized he was teasing again. She couldn't imagine sleeping right next to Alex with his dark, sexy eyes and gorgeous face. 
but she couldn't exactly ask him to sleep on the floor when there was a comfortable bed available. This was stupid. Why was she hesitating? I thought you'd never ask, she answered. Alex grinned. See, Christmas wishes do come true. He was way too happy about the sleeping arrangements. She smiled and shook her head. Want to give me a hand moving the coffee table, and then we'll get this bad boy pulled out. After moving the table, Katie could no longer ignore the pressing urge to use the bathroom. She put on her coat. I'm going outside to get more wood. Alex eyed the good-sized pile of logs. The corner of his mouth turned up into his familiar smirk. I was wondering how long you could hold it. If you go around the house to the right, the wind has kept the snowdrifts to a minimum. Katie felt her face turn red. Thanks. She quickly slipped on her shoes and made for the door. One more thing, he called. Yeah? She looked back, wanting to escape. Watch out for yellow snow. She rolled her eyes and left him alone with his laughter. Outside, the storm raged. She wished she had a TV or the internet so she could watch radar and know how soon the storm would end. The wind whipped right through her baggy sweatpants. Alex was right. If she stayed close to the side of the cabin, there was a lot less snow. She edged around the corner and looked around for prying eyes. Duh. There was no one up here in the middle of no man's land to watch her go to the bathroom. She grabbed her waistband and pulled down the sweats and her panties in one quick swoop. She squatted and tried to relax and go, but arctic air blew against her, a sensation she had surely never experienced before. The air felt so cold, she wondered if her pee would freeze before it hit the snow. She noticed the surrounding woods. What wild animals were out there? Deer? Bear? Coyote? She tried to hurry and get back inside before some large furry creature attacked her. Back in the cabin, Katie kicked off her snow-covered boots. Holy cripes, it's cold out there. Alex stood next to the couch that he had made up with blankets and pillows from the bedroom and throw blankets off the couch. The scene looked like something out of a cheesy romance movie. Okay, this is weird, right? He asked. That's putting it mildly. She laid her coat on a chair and rubbed her cold hands together by the fire. I'm going to step outside for a minute. I'll be right back. He slipped on his coat. Alex disappeared, giving Katie a minute to let it soak in. It was only a bed. She sat on the side and touched the soft, woven throw blanket. She bit back a grin. She was going to sleep in a bed with Alex. Her roommate, Lindsay, was going to love this. She crawled in and pulled the blankets over her, careful not to hog. A metal bar crossed the middle of her back, reminding her that this was a cheap fold-out bed. Alex reappeared and shook the snow from his coat. Honey, I'm home. Katie hid her smile. You're late, she called. He added more wood to the fire and placed a large metal screen in front of it. I figure we don't need to burn the place down. Alex sat on his side of the bed with his back to her. Katie chewed on the inside of her lip. He pulled back the covers and slipped in next to her. Katie lay with her arms at her sides, trying not to breathe too loud. She sensed Alex watching her. She turned her head. His handsome face was only two feet from hers. You doing okay? He asked, sincerity in his voice. I'm good. She smiled and relaxed wiggling to get comfortable on the thin mattress. Good. He turned his head toward the ceiling. Katie looked up and noticed, for the first time, a chandelier made from deer antlers. They lay in silence and watched the firelight dance on the ceiling. Will Trina be mad that you slept with someone else, even though we're only sleeping? Trina won't be mad. She will freak out. Oh, crap. I'm sorry. No, it's not your fault. Trina is the world's biggest drama queen. She freaks out when she breaks a nail or it's raining outside. 
She's always freaking out. Oh. Katie couldn't imagine why he was with a girl like that. You don't need to worry about Trina. I've got it under control. Or at least I will soon. She wondered what he meant. Would they have a big fight? Would he shower her with kisses and apologize? Would he give in to her tantrum? Katie realized she'd finally discovered a trait of Alex's that she didn't like. Being with a girl who wasn't good enough for him. Another minute passed before Alex spoke. Is it just me, or are our feet higher than our heads? It's like I'm laying downhill. I think I'm getting a headache from the blood rushing to my brain. Katie laughed. I noticed that too. They looked at each other across the pillows. Want to switch directions? He asked, like a little kid on an adventure. Yeah. They hopped out of bed and tossed their pillows to the floor. Together, they pulled the sheets out and slid the blankets and everything down and tucked them in at the sofa end. They tossed the pillows back and hopped in at the foot of the bed. Their heads were closer to the fire now instead of their feet. I feel like I'm at a slumber party. Katie puffed up her pillow and nestled her head down. Alex turned over a couple times, the bed squeaking with each movement, and settled facing her. This is the most uncomfortable bed I've ever slept in. The fire's really warm. Katie tossed the top two blankets to the side. Hey, I don't want them. I'm sweating over here. He pushed the covers toward their feet. Sorry. She sat up and removed her flannel shirt, leaving her in a t-shirt and sweatpants. I built the fire up so it would last through the night. I didn't realize I would be creating a sauna. Katie lay on her stomach, watching the fire. She yawned. The flames licked up high. The wood burned with a soft roar and an occasional crackle. Light flickered throughout the room. That's okay. The fire looks nice. Alex rolled over, his elbow brushing her arm. That is a damn good fire. She smiled. The best I've seen. I bet you haven't seen too many. Nope. She grew more sleepy by the minute. You know, this is the most fun I've had in a really long time. Alex sounded relaxed and happy. Her eyes drifted shut. Mm Mm-hmm. I think you're about to fall asleep. She heard a trace of humor in his voice. Uh Mm-hmm. Alex awoke the next morning with a chilly backside, but a warm chest. He leaned toward the source of warmth. His face brushed against a soft head of hair. He opened an eyelid and found Katie curled into a ball against his chest. He grinned. All the blankets were pushed to the foot of the bed, and other than a few dying embers, the fire was out. He resisted the urge to snuggle closer to his little ball of heat. Instead, he moved as quietly as possible from the bed to stoke the fire. The bed creaked loudly, but Katie didn't move a muscle. Heavy sleeper, that one. The floor felt cold as a meat locker, and his breath turned to wisps of white in the frigid air. A glance out the window revealed the fierce storm still blowing. He removed the metal screen and loaded the fireplace with wood. Sparks flew as the wood caught fire. He crawled back into the creaky bed and pulled all the blankets up. He spread them over Katie first, tucking them around her face, which he couldn't actually see because her mane of hair covered her like Cousin It. He stretched out on his side of the bed and covered himself. The room was freezing. He looked over Katie, the hot mess, fast asleep. He gave in to his desire for warmth and moved closer to her. As if on cue, she snuggled into him like a newborn kitten. Alex smiled, and even though he knew he shouldn't, he wrapped his arms around her warm little body and fell back to sleep. A couple hours later, he woke to a warmer room, a tangle of sheets, and Katie sprawled across the bed. Her body stretched against his with one arm extended over her head and her elbow in his face. 
She'd flung her other arm out, hogging the bed. One leg rested against his. She started making little noises, like she was eating. Alex muffled his laugh. She wiped her hand over her face, pushing away stray hair. So this was how the beautiful Katie woke in the morning, like a sloppy, noisy bum. Would she fart next? She started to hum. This time he did laugh. Katie quieted and he knew she was awake. She turned her head, only to find his face mere inches away. Her eyes widened. She jerked away and scooted back to her side. Someone's a bed hog, he teased. What? No, I'm not, she growled in a low, throaty voice. Yes, you are. I didn't even have room to roll over. She tried to get out of bed, but her legs were tangled in the sheets. Need some help? He offered. She ignored him and kicked the sheets away. Oh, looks like someone woke up on the wrong side of the hide bed She aimed daggers at him and kicked the covers away. With her eyes half opened, she stumbled to the bathroom. He heard her mutter, Crap. She reappeared a second later and pulled two blankets from the pile. She wrapped them around her shoulders and headed for the door. She slipped into his boots and pulled two tissues out of the box as she went out the door. Sweet, polite Katie was not a morning person. He rolled on his back and laughed. While she was outside, he put the last of the wood on the fire and placed the pot of water near it to heat. With any luck, there would be some coffee in one of the cupboards. When she came back in, he was rifling through the cupboards. Look what I found. He held up an almost empty jar of instant coffee. Katie shivered. Jeez, it's freezing out there. She started to kick the boots off. As long as you've already been outside, you mind getting another pot of snow? She shot him the stink eye. You're the one wearing the boots, it makes sense. He flashed her a bright smile and pushed an empty pot into her hands. Thanks, you're the best. She pulled the blankets tighter, grumbled, and went back into the deep freeze, returning in mere seconds with a heaping pot of snow. She kicked off his boots, took the snow straight to the fireplace, and set it to melt. She curled up in the blankets and sat on the hearth. Careful you don't get too close. I'd hate to see you go up in flames. Are you always this chipper in the morning? She asked in an irritated tone. Nope. Only when I'm snowbound in a cabin with a strange girl who snores. Her head snapped toward him. What? I don't snore. He cringed for her benefit and shook his head. I'm just saying. He loved her look of horror. Katie stared at the fire, her hair a tangled mess and smudged makeup under her eyes. She mumbled so quietly he barely heard. I don't snore. He turned his back and chuckled, then collected a couple mugs, coffee, and a metal camp-style coffee pot. I bet you'll feel more human with a little caffeine in your system. Chapter 9 Ten minutes later, they held steaming mugs of mediocre coffee as the wind whistled through the tiny cracks in the window frames. It's not Starbucks, but it sure does the trick, Alex said. Katie sipped her brew and watched Alex. A hint of beard shadowed his face and made him even better looking, if that was possible. His hair stuck up haphazardly, in a sexy sort of way. His expressive brown eyes were filled with humor, especially when he teased her. He smiled a lot, and it was getting under her skin. Did he know the effect he had on girls? On her? The snow collected in the corners of all the windows, like on the Christmas show she used to watch as a kid. I don't think the storm is going to let up anytime soon. It looks like it's going to snow over the entire cabin. I wish I could get a message to my mom. I don't want her worrying when we're totally fine. By now, my parents will definitely be worried. I hate to do that to them. I wonder if the plow has been through on the road. If it has, 
Maybe the driver saw my truck and will report it. I hope so. She watched the snow accumulate at the corners of the window. On the bright side, think how happy they'll be when we get out of here, he said. Katie pictured her mom hugging her and saying how much she loved her. Then her mom would apologize for making Katie come up north for Christmas when they should have stayed home like normal. Katie pictured a fresh start with her mom. Alex drained his coffee and put the mug by the sink. I think I'll go out and get more wood. He retrieved his boots from where she kicked them off. He put them on, along with his coat and hat. Back in a few. He flashed his sexy eyes at her as he went out the door. Katie's heart skipped a beat, and then she chastised herself. Stop liking some other girl's man. Not okay. She checked her jeans to find them a little stiff, but totally dry. Quick, before Alex came back, she slipped out of the oversized sweats and into her jeans. They hugged her close and felt much better. Normal. She retrieved her purse and rummaged around for her makeup bag. Spotting her phone first, she gambled on a long shot and checked it for a signal. Crap. Not only no signal, but the battery was dead. That was stupid. She should have turned it off. She tossed it back in the bag and pulled out her makeup. She looked in her compact mirror to discover huge smudges of mascara under both eyes. Oh my god. She licked her finger and rubbed it under each eye. Better, but she needed a washcloth. She fetched one from the small bathroom and caught a glimpse of herself in the dark mirror and groaned. Her hair stuck up all over. She thought Alex's hair looked funny. No wonder Alex kept laughing at her. Here she was thinking how hot he looked, and he must have been looking at her thinking, what a train wreck. She washed her face and combed her hair. A couple minutes later, after she brushed her teeth and tossed the water outside, she applied some mascara and a flick of blush. Alex arrived with a load of wood. They repeated the pattern from yesterday, where she stacked while he went back and forth. Each time the door opened, she swore the cabin temperature plummeted another 10 degrees. She added more pieces to the fire. Breakfast consisted of watery tomato soup. She wanted to make something better, but was saving the last of the bread for that evening in case they didn't get rescued. At the rate the snow kept coming, Alex could be right, and they could be here another day. No pancakes? Alex asked, slurping his soup. Katie wrinkled her nose. Let me just say that the mice left a little something special in the box. I see. Boy, this soup is awesome, he said. She might have believed him if it weren't for the twinkle in his gorgeous dark eyes. She focused on her soup instead. I was thinking we should check out the rest of the cabin to see if there's anything else we can use, Alex said. Like a hidden snowplow? It is Christmas. Aren't wishes supposed to come true? He set his empty bowl on the coffee table. I don't know. Were you a good boy or a bad boy? She asked. Let me assure you, I am a very good boy. He wiggled his eyebrows at her in a naughty sort of way. Katie knew she'd walked right into that one. I bet you are. She responded pretending he didn't affect her. After swishing their dishes clean in some warm water, they checked out the two closets off the hallway. The first one held towels, extra sheets, and blankets, and a few games. Alex dug through the other closet. This might be our lucky day, he called over his shoulder. What? Katie tried to peek past him, but couldn't see anything beyond broom handles and trash bags. Look! He held out a black snowsuit with reflector tape strategically placed. She eyed it with skepticism. And how exactly does that make this our lucky day? Wait for it. He reached back in the closet, bending down to pick something off the floor. She couldn't help but notice how nicely his jeans hugged his backside. Alex looked so fine, she was actually jealous of denim. He turned and showed off a large helmet. She looked at the helmet 
and then at Alex. Sorry, you lost me. It's a snowmobile suit and helmet. As in, there must be a snowmobile in the shed outside? We can get out of here and I can have you delivered to your mom and not the boyfriend in time for Christmas Eve dinner. You think so? That would be great. Sort of. Although Katie really wanted to see her mom, she liked hanging out with Alex and hated to see it end. Want to see if there's a snowmobile out there? He asked. The eager look on his face was infectious. She grinned. Totally. Outside, they struggled through the drifts. The wind still whipped, but it didn't seem like new snow. More like last night's snow blowing around. The door to the shed was snowed shut. They worked together, sweeping snow away with their hands. And then Alex used his boot to clear the snow closer to the ground. Katie wished she'd worn the musty old snowmobile suit. Her jeans were already snow-covered. Her scarf kept blowing off, sending an extra chill through her. Alex pulled on the metal door handle, opening the wooden door only a couple inches. Katie fell to her knees and scooped more snow out of the way. Within a couple minutes, Alex opened the door wide enough for them to squeeze inside. It took a moment to adjust to the dim light. A small window on each side of the shed allowed the limited light. They turned to each other at the same moment. There it is. I knew it, he said. Oh my God, we're getting out of here? She squealed at the side of the snowmobile. Alex held out his arms, and without thinking, Katie bounded into them, receiving his excited bear hug. His strong arms wrapped around her, holding her to his strong, muscled chest. Despite them both wearing thick winter coats, the hug seemed a little too personal, like she should have a much closer relationship with him than carpool companion. But Katie didn't care. She squeezed him back, and the side of her head brushed his chin. He released her, and she stepped away, pretending his touch hadn't affected her. He peered closer at the big machine. The enthusiasm in his voice dropped. His forehead wrinkled. We have a problem. I don't see any keys. They must be here someplace. She scanned the walls of the shed looking for a nail they might be on. No luck. Alex moved some lawn chairs. Sometimes cabin owners hide the keys of things they don't want stolen. If the robber can't find the keys, it's a lot harder to steal something. Together they lifted rakes and shovels and buckets looking for the elusive keys. Their plan is working. She couldn't believe they'd come so close to getting out of here only to have to solve a hidden key mystery. Alex rolled a small lawnmower out of the way. Nothing. Katie tried to move a large pot filled with soil and a shriveled up plant. Need a hand? He squatted next to her. I think I've got it. She gave it a heave and fell back on her butt. Maybe not. She laughed. Let me give it a shot. Alex grabbed the side of the clay pot and strained hard to move it. He fell, knocking her onto her back. He held a piece of the pot in his hands. Oops. He rolled next to her on the frozen ground. Sorry about that. You okay? She edged up onto her elbows. Aw, come on. A strong guy like you should be able to lift it. Is that so? He leaned on an elbow, his face mere inches away. Katie didn't dare move. Alex gazed into her eyes, a playful smile on his face. She was afraid to breathe. And suddenly, his gaze wasn't playful. It shifted to something else. He looked at her mouth, and before she could process what was happening, he lowered his lips to hers. Chapter 10 his lips were cold, but his breath felt warm. He kissed her tentatively, softly. He pulled away for an instant, as if considering his actions, but returned. His kisses were soft, short, leisurely. She was trapped on her elbows, not wanting him to stop, but knowing it was wrong. She didn't care, at least not at that moment. His mouth felt firm and sexy and eager for more. A million thoughts shot through her brain like fireworks, but only one emotion won out. 
She didn't want this to end. She couldn't tell him to stop. She didn't want to. It was as if he lowered a shield of desire over them and she'd become helpless to his kisses. And she liked it. Too much. He lifted his mouth. She sighed as cool air separated them. His dark brown eyes gazed deep into hers. She recognized the desire that mirrored her own. But he didn't belong to her. He belonged to Trina. He was engaged to Trina. And he saw it the minute her emotions shifted from want to guilt, and he pulled away. Logic flooded back. You're engaged, she accused. I know. He sat back. What kind of guy kisses someone they've known for less than 24 hours when he's getting married? She sat up and touched her mouth, meaning to wipe away his kisses, but instead, touching her lips as if to make sure they had really happened. I shouldn't have done that. I couldn't help it. His head drooped. Did she hear him right? You couldn't help it? Oh my God. Do you cheat on her all the time? You are, you are horrible. She scrambled to her feet and stepped away from him. No, it's not like that. It's complicated. Thoughts of her parents' comments crashed in. It's complicated, her dad had said when Katie asked if he cheated on her mother. You think that by saying your life is complicated, it makes it okay to cheat on your fiancé? I thought you were a really nice guy. I can't believe I was actually jealous of her. Now I feel sorry for her. Katie pushed the door open and left Alex alone in the shed with the snowmobile they couldn't drive. Why did this funny, gorgeous guy who was off the dating market, have to turn her world upside down by kissing her. He took advantage of her, and he had no right. Katie deserved better. It was shades of her home life playing over again, only dragging her into it as a main character. People were misbehaving, and she was stuck in the middle. She stormed her way back to the cabin. Aw, shit. Alex pushed a hand through his hair. What the heck was he doing? But he did know. Katie was so damned beautiful and smart and playful. She was everything that Trina wasn't. He looked at the spot she'd vacated. Her red scarf lay all bright and cheery on the cold, hard floor. He lifted it to his face. The soft fabric caught on his unshaven chin. The smell of something fruity wafted from the scarf. Her shampoo, maybe. He inhaled deeply and then stuffed the garment in his pocket. Kissing Katie was a stupid move, but he didn't regret it. Granted, he'd screwed everything up with her, and he'd have time to explain the whole sordid Trina mess. He really wanted to put that whole nightmare behind him. What he needed to do was put his foot down with Trina and prove he meant what he said when he broke up with her. Easier said than done. After searching the shed a while longer for keys, with no luck, he hoped he might find them in the cabin somewhere but then he discovered an empty gas can and realized he better check the snowmobile's fuel level. The gauge read empty. Great. They were screwed. He knew the only thing Katie wanted was to get away from him, and he didn't blame her. But then again, Katie did say she'd been jealous of Trina. Did that mean she was interested in him? At least interested before he kissed her and created another mess? Alex gave up on the shed and stepped outside, One glance at the cabin, and he decided to give Katie more time to cool off. Katie paced the cabin, pissed at Alex for making her feel so stupid. He was engaged and had no business kissing her. One gazed deep into his eyes, and she fell hook, line, and sinker. She was such an idiot. And how dare he kiss her like that when he was marrying another girl? She snatched the sweatpants she'd been wearing earlier and changed back into them. Their unsuccessful romp outside left her jeans wet from the thighs down. She needed something to distract her and keep her mind occupied. In a minute, Alex would walk through the door looking all tall and handsome with those deep, soulful eyes of his. She didn't want him to know how much he affected her. One glance at their meager food supply on the counter, and she decided to check the cupboards more thoroughly now that daylight streamed in. She discovered bowls and dishes, a drawer of old plastic shopping bags. 
The cupboards were bare until she reached the corner cupboard. Inside, she discovered some spices, olive oil, a jar of bouillon, vinegar, and other items that weren't exactly food, but might improve the remaining supplies. She glanced at the beat-up Harvest Gold fridge with its cord unplugged. For the heck of it, she opened the door. Her jaw dropped, then turned into a huge grin. She'd discovered a gold mine. While the unplugged fridge couldn't keep food cold, it did provide a secure place to store dry goods. Among the goodies, she found a package of spaghetti, a box of seasoned rice, snack crackers, hot cocoa packets, and three bottles of wine. She pulled the items out, hugging them to her body. If they were still here tonight, they'd celebrate Christmas with a feast. Alex pulled out Katie's scarf, wrapped it around his neck, and headed for the main road. Maybe the plow had been through and he could wave down a car. He plodded through the snowdrifts, trying to stay near the trees where the snow wasn't as deep. The wind blasted him. He hadn't worn his hat because he didn't think they'd be outside for long. He pulled the scarf higher. Maybe this was his penance for the pain he would soon deliver to Trina. She'd fought him tooth and nail for months, begging him to forgive her and not tell anyone they were on the rocks. He figured that the distance of school would be enough separation that she'd loosen her clutches and let him go. Instead, it was the opposite. Finally reaching the road, he saw that a plow had been through at some point, but the blowing snow had drifted back across the road, creating deep waves like an angry sea. The weather prediction appeared to be right so far. There wouldn't be much traffic, if any, on this road for a while. Thank God they found the cabin with enough food to see them through. If someone spotted his abandoned truck, his mom would go insane with worry. He wanted to leave some sort of sign in case the authorities were out looking for them. He unwrapped Katie's bright scarf and knotted it tightly to the mailbox. That ought to do the trick. He pulled the collar of his coat higher and stuffed his hands deep in his pockets as he braced against the wind and followed his tracks back to the cabin. The blowing snow was already erasing his footsteps. Twenty minutes later, Katie breathed a sigh of relief when Alex returned, along with a blast of wind and snow. She smiled brightly and pretended their kiss never happened. I was starting to get nervous. You were gone a long time. I thought I might have to go out after you. Or that he was rescued and left her behind. She wiped that thought away. Alex would never do that. I was fine. No need to worry. He towed off his boots and then pulled off his gloves and coat, avoiding eye contact. Maybe, but in a bad blizzard, people have actually walked past their house and not even known they've missed it. You could have frozen to death, she said. Alex hung his coat over a chair. That's why Paul tied a rope from the front door to the barn. He bit back a smile. She looked at him cockeyed. You read Little House on the Prairie? He warmed himself by the fire. My mom used to read it to us as kids. He grinned. Bet you didn't expect me to know my Laura Ingalls Wilder. No, you surprised me with that one. Now I've got a surprise for you. She joined him at the hearth, glad to be getting along with him after the awkward moment in the shed. She used a hot pad and poured hot water from the kettle into a cracked Green Bay Packers mug and another mug advertising fishing lures. She stirred the contents up and handed him the Packer mug. He looked at it with disbelief. Is this hot cocoa? Yup. He took a whiff of the steamy drink. Where do you find it? He was about to take a sip and then paused. There aren't mouse droppings in it, and you're trying to get back at me, are you? She laughed. No, it turns out the fridge was packed with food. Apparently, that's where you hide stuff you don't want the critters to find. We will be feasting big tonight. Alex sat near the fire and took a sip. Oh, that's good. He closed his eyes and savored the taste. His sated expression reminded Katie of how she felt when he kissed her. Only thing better would be a shot of schnapps. Did you find any of that? He asked. No schnapps, but I found three bottles of wine. No way. That is awesome. 
Looks like we're going to have a party. Katie relaxed, knowing they were over their earlier fight. After a lunch of jelly on stale snack crackers and more hot chocolate, they sat on the braided rug in front of the coffee table and played Scrabble. Alex came up with one word after another, but the only words Katie came up with she couldn't use. Love, hug, kiss, lips. It took all her concentration to come up with words that didn't make her look like a lovesick stalker. Alex interrupted her thoughts. What do you say? Should we open a bottle of wine? I'm sorry. I know I'm taking forever. She looked at her letters and all she saw was H-U-N-K. Take your time. I just figured it might be a nice way to pass the afternoon. We'll still have another bottle for dinner. Sure, I'll try some. Her drinking experience consisted mainly of beer or flavored vodkas mixed with juice at college parties. She'd only tried a few sips of wine at her cousin's wedding. Alex brought over an open wine bottle along with two mismatched drinking glasses. They must keep the fine crystal at their other place. He set the glasses on the coffee table and poured a little of the red liquid into each glass. Katie lifted her glass swirling it like a wine aficionado, and sniffed. It's a very good year. Says here it's called Red Satin. Bottled. He spun the bottle around looking for a date. This year. And a very good year it was. Not, she added, thinking of her parents' divorce, their secrecy, and her mom's new Christmas activities. Katie was now the product of a broken home. Alex lifted his glass. Cheers to a less than stellar year. She clicked her glass to his. I'll drink to that. She took a tentative sip, happy to discover the wine mild and easy on the taste buds. Alex took a sip and sat down across from her. She watched him push a hand through his hair and sighed. I know why my year sucked, but what was wrong with yours? Well... He said, it's a long story. We're sure not going anywhere soon. The fire flicked light over the shadows of his unshaven face. She resisted the urge to reach out and touch the rough stubble. He huffed. Is it school? She asked. No, school is great. I love school and Madison and getting out of Ashland. School is the best decision I ever made. He took another drink and set the glass down. Ah, hell. It's a big cluster. He leaned forward with his head in his hands. Katie couldn't imagine what could be so wrong about his life. Her roommate said he was engaged. She didn't mention anything about family troubles, and it obviously wasn't school. You don't have to talk about it if you don't want to. He rubbed his hands over his face. No, it's okay. Maybe if I actually tell someone, it'll be easier for me to get through. You know about Trina? Your fiancé? She nodded. He rolled his eyes. Not your fiancé? No. She is. Sort of. Oh. The truth dawned on her. You don't want to be engaged anymore. Hope blossomed inside her. He grimaced. Exactly. And you plan on breaking up with her? He nodded. On Christmas? He nodded again. Katie cringed. Ouch. But inside she felt a leap of joy, kind of like her Christmas came early. She touched her mouth, thinking of his earlier kiss. Now it didn't seem quite as wrong. I know, it's bad. Alex drummed his fingers on the coffee table. So, do you have to break it off now? I mean, couldn't you wait until... New Year's? Because that wouldn't hurt either. Or right before I head back to school. He shook his head. No matter what I do, I'm screwed. I'll come off as ten times the asshole. He started to bounce his leg. The poor guy was a mess. She had to agree his timing couldn't be worse. Unless... 
She doesn't have a Christmas birthday, does she? Because that would be downright cruel. No. I've tried breaking up with her before, and she ignores me and acts like nothing ever happened. Wow. You've been thinking about this for a while. She took a large drink of wine. Pretty much every second since she told me she lost the baby. Chapter 11 There. He'd said the words. She knew. Katie choked on her wine and coughed. Baby? Back the truck up. Start over. From the beginning. He took a fortifying gulp of wine. I've had problems for the last year and a half. Trina and I started dating our junior year of high school. She was the hot girl, and well, we had fun together. One glance at Katie, and he knew she was still digesting the baby comment. After high school, I wanted to go to college and get on with my life, but Trina didn't want me to go to Madison. She wanted me to go someplace closer to home, like Sturgeon Bay or maybe Eau Claire. When she figured out I was sticking to Madison, she said that if anyone could make a long-distance relationship work, it was us. I liked her a lot, and I was clueless, so I said I was willing to give it a try. But while I was at school, she turned into some small-town prima donna acting like she was better than everyone else. He glanced at Katie. She listened and didn't say a word. He didn't want her thinking badly of him. Everything about her was light and refreshing. He worried that sharing his shitty life with Katie would drive her away. I don't know if I just didn't see it before or if Trina changed. She was probably the most popular girl in school and she knew it. Still, I figured she'd do something with her life after graduation. But she didn't. No. If anything, she became more self-obsessed and mean. It's like she wanted to be the queen bee of the whole town. She started sticking her nose in other people's business and gossiping like an old woman. All she wants is for us to get married and start having kids. She even talked her dad about me going to work for him. He owns the largest logging company in three counties. Trina has it all figured out. Trina sounds like a real piece of work, Katie mumbled, then looked up. Oh, did I say that out loud? He smiled weakly. It took me a while to see what she was doing. After freshman year when I came home for the summer, I knew I needed to end it. She wanted us to move into an apartment together. It was like she wanted to play house or something. We were 19. The more distance I tried to put between us, the more she held on. She was jealous of every friend I had and always thought I was cheating on her. I don't know if she was watching those Bridezilla reality shows or what. She mentioned getting married, and when she saw the terror in my eyes, she backed off. But you ended up engaged anyway, Katie said. Yeah, she got pregnant, which was a miracle because we'd only been together one time since I came back from school. And that was after I got drunk on my birthday. So you offered to marry her. I didn't want to be the jerk who walked away from his own kid. That wouldn't be right. Before I knew it, Trina and her mom set a date and she's out shopping for dresses. Alex looked at Katie's expression. You think I'm an idiot for knocking up a girl I wanted to break up with? No! I feel bad because you're a really nice guy who was taken advantage of. He rolled his eyes and took another sip of wine. When she set the date for a Valentine's Day wedding, I knew something wasn't right. She should have been about eight months pregnant by then. When I asked her about it, she said she'd lost the baby and started to cry. At first I was devastated, but that changed into relief. Relief that I didn't have to be a teenage father and relief that I didn't have to get married. Alex, I am so sorry. Katie's beautiful eyes showed a compassion he never saw in Trina. His shoulders tensed. When I started asking Trina questions about when she lost the baby, she went postal and blurted out that she'd never actually been pregnant at all. She'd only been late on her period. Katie's lip curled into a sneer. That dirty skank. 
He forced a smile and nodded. Katie had nailed it on the head. So why are you still together? She asked. Because I'm an idiot. Katie raised an eyebrow. Trina begged me not to break it off because she'd be humiliated and her parents would be heartbroken. She said we could work it out and promised to stop acting so jealous. She even talked about taking classes at the community college. But you didn't want to be engaged to her. No. But you stayed engaged. Alex raised his hands in the air. I know. I'm such a doormat. I figured that as soon as I got back to school, I could call her and break it off for good. If she wasn't around to manipulate me, I could make it stick. And? Katie asked. He stood and began to pace. And then her grandma died. I called Trina's mom to tell her how sorry I was that her mother died, and Trina's mom kept going on and on about how happy it made her that Trina and I were getting married. Are you always this big a pushover? Katie shook her head. No, I'm really not. There's something about Trina. She always manages to get her way. It's like she has a master's in manipulation. Trina was a sneaky, spoiled brat who didn't understand the word no. Katie poured more wine into their glasses, then set the bottle down. I used to babysit for a family, and the little girl always got her way. No matter how hard I tried to stand my ground, the little shit always outmaneuvered me. That's Trina! He picked up his glass and took a sip. But this time, it's going to be different. And how is that? She asked, clearly doubting him. Because she knows, he said, pacing again. That you're going to break up? Yup. I've emailed her and tried to talk to her on the phone. She keeps evading me and saying that once we're together, it'll all be okay. But that's not going to happen. I am done with her. And it was true. He'd had it up to his eyeballs. I really hope you do. You deserve much better. But how's it going to be different this time? I'm going to sit her down, along with her parents, and keep telling her until she understands. That or until her dad throws me out. Yikes. She cringed. I know it's harsh, but it's the only way I can think of to get it through a thick skull. With an audience. I sure wouldn't want to be you, she said. He watched her swirl the wine in her glass. He shrugged. At this point, I don't even care. I'm so immune to her drama. I need this thing over. That explains why you weren't looking forward to going home for Christmas. They were both quiet for a minute, watching the fire. Katie spoke. Does anyone in your family know? My brother Jason. He knows everything. He'll help run interference for me. My parents know she lied about the baby. I'm sure they've guessed the rest. The brother who loves snow? That's him. Jason used to harass the heck out of me when we were kids. But if someone else gave me trouble... He always had my back. Katie glanced out the window. Look! It stopped snowing! She hopped up and ran to the window. The snow and wind had died down. A thick white blanket of snow coated the yard and trees like icy frosting. It looks like a Christmas card, Alex said. It's beautiful. I wish my phone wasn't dead. I'd take a picture. Let me check mine. He went through his bag and pulled out his phone. Let's see if this baby will juice up. He pressed some buttons, and a few seconds later, the phone played a tune as it powered up. Bingo. Can you get a signal? She peeked past his shoulder, her pretty face a few inches from his. Alex pushed aside his feelings. Katie wouldn't appreciate him hitting on her after hearing his lame confession. He held the phone up to the window. Nothing here. He walked around the cabin watching the screen. Nothing. Not even one bar. How are we ever going to get out of here? Don't worry. I'll get you out of here and back to your mom in one piece. Have confidence, ye of little faith. 
He aimed his phone out the picture window and snapped a shot of the beautiful scene, and then a quick one of Katie, in case he never saw her again. He put his phone away. Oh, I forgot to tell you, your scarf fell off in the shed. I tied it to the mailbox out by the road. That ought to help signal anyone out looking for us. I hope that's okay. That's a great idea. Now that the snow and wind have stopped, plow should be all over these roads. Plus, my family isn't known for staying idle. I'm sure they're ready to send out a search team. He could picture his dad coordinating all their friends and neighbors and spreading out over every county road. My mom must be going nuts. I feel so bad. She stared out at the pristine scene. Alex put his arm around her shoulders and gave her a comforting squeeze. It's going to be fine. It'll all be over soon. He liked how Katie fit under the curve of his chin. Thanks. She put her arms around his waist for a quick hug, but then removed it and let air separate them. He stepped away so it wouldn't get awkward. I know what will cheer you up. I can't believe I didn't think of this until now. He went to his bags. What? He pulled out his laptop. I have music on my laptop and enough battery life to last for at least a couple hours. They were going to have fun tonight no matter what. Soon he'd be facing reality, but right now they had this magical whisper of a Christmas Eve. Oh my God, that's a great idea. Do you have any Christmas music? Because I've got all kinds. She rushed for her laptop too, her face bright with excitement. I don't know, let's see. He turned it on. The familiar dings and hum of his computer filled the air. It's weird hearing the sounds of technology when it's been so quiet in the cabin without power, she said. It's music to my ears. He clicked away at his computer. I've got a lot of stuff, but I'm not finding anything Christmas. Katie powered up her laptop. My guess is that you have a lot of country music. He grinned. And you have a problem with country music? No, if your tastes are just a bit one-dimensional. I happen to like a lot of music, but country is my favorite right now. Well, I've got a motherload of holiday music. My mom collects Christmas CDs. Who knows? There might even be a couple of country Christmas songs. Her computer lit up, and she clicked a couple of icons. Oh my god! A connection to the real world? This is amazing. Even though we can't get Wi-Fi, I almost want to kiss the screen. And I want to kiss you again, Alex thought, but didn't dare say. Chapter 12 with Christmas tunes playing softly from her laptop and the firelight flickering, it truly felt like Christmas Eve. Katie experienced the same joy she did as a little kid, only instead of anticipating presents, this year she looked forward to a one-of-a-kind Christmas with Alex. Could you please hand me the olive oil? Thanks. She accepted the bottle and swirled the oil around the large frying pan she'd heated over the fire. Her face felt hot from working so close to the flames. But she didn't care. She'd never had this much fun making dinner, and Alex liked helping, which made it even better. Okay, now pour in the pasta. Alex had been in charge of cooking the pasta, which turned out to be tricky. The water barely reached a boil, but the pasta eventually cooked. He leaned close to Katie and poured the sticky noodles into her fry pan. She enjoyed the scent of his skin and the way his hair curled around his ears. What exactly are you making? He asked as she mixed the noodles in with the olive oil and added dried parsley flakes from a spice bottle. I'll call it stir fry minus most of the ingredients. If we had some chicken or onions, that would help a lot. She sprinkled garlic and onion powder over the top and gently shook the pan to saute the pasta. The spices in the cupboard were a bonus. You want to turn the garlic toast again? Sure. He used the tongs and flipped each piece of bread. She drizzled olive oil on the remaining slices of sourdough bread, along with garlic powder and some red pepper flakes. This smells amazing. 
he flashed her a hungry smile. It's the garlic. I love garlic. Okay, I think it's done. She dumped the stir-fried pasta into a large bowl and set it on the coffee table that she decorated for their Christmas dinner. A white sheet from the linen closet served as a tablecloth. She found a basket of pine cones in the corner and arranged them with pine boughs from outside. Their nearly burned out candle nestled in the center. Where do you want the bread? Here. She held out a small plate and he slid the slices onto it. This looks so good. Alex said, and she couldn't agree more. They both sat down and looked at their small feast. Oh, I almost forgot. She grabbed the can of Parmesan cheese and rattled it until the cheese loosened up. She sprinkled it over the pasta. There. Katie leaned back as Josh Groban's Christmas song, Believe, played. Not a bad sentiment considering their situation. Alex poured them each a glass of wine from a freshly opened bottle. This is one of the coolest Christmases I've ever had. I don't think I'll ever forget it. I'll probably be telling my grandkids someday about the Christmas Eve I was holed up in a cabin with a beautiful girl and we cooked our holiday dinner over a fire. Katie's face flushed, and it wasn't from the heat of the fire. Here's to the cabin owners. Thank you for leaving us food. They raised their glasses. I'll drink to that. Alex took a sip. I'm starved. They filled up their plates with Katie's creative dinner. The crunchy toast tasted warm and garlicky. The pasta was a little sticky, but the combination of olive oil and spices worked well. Katie, this tastes great, Alex said, swirling pasta on his fork. It's because you're really hungry. But I agree. It turned out pretty good, considering we didn't have an actual stove. If this were a normal Christmas Eve, what would you be doing? He asked, taking another bite. She wiped her mouth on a dish towel. It would be only my immediate family. We don't see my grandparents and cousins until Christmas Day. That's when we'd have the big ham dinner. Mom would put out appetizers around 4.30 in the afternoon, and we'd play games. When we were little, we played spoons. The last few years we've played Oh Hell. Oh Hell? Alex laughed and his eyes danced. What kind of game is that to play on Christmas? It's a card game. She smiled, remembering all the hours her family played games. It can be a very frustrating game, hence the name. And then she realized her family would never celebrate Christmas like that again. You're frowning. What's wrong? Alex asked. It's nothing. I was just thinking about how all my family traditions are gone forever. He set his fork down and reached over to take her hand. I know it sucks that everything's changed, but it won't always feel this horrible. He gave her hand a squeeze and released it. She wished he hadn't. Thanks. She forced a smile, but didn't really believe him. She missed her dad, but didn't want to. She was pretty sure he was behind her parents' sudden breakup. And you can start new traditions, like cooking over an open fire and sleeping with some strange guy you've just met. The mischievous glint in his eyes made her laugh. That might be a little tricky to arrange every year. She shook her head, imagining a repeat of this every year. So what does your family do Christmas Eve? Katie asked to get her mind off crawling in bed with Alex tonight. Now that he'd kissed her and she knew he wasn't planning to get married, she felt more nervous about crawling under the sheets with him. We watch the Muppet Christmas Carol and pig out on cookies. My mom bakes like crazy all season, but we only get to eat the Christmas cookies at a holiday party or once Christmas actually arrives. That always makes me crazy. Katie picked up another piece of bread. My mom makes a gingerbread house every year. They're super tacky looking, but she tries hard. I used to make one too, but I haven't the past couple of years. Not sure why. We have this tradition called hide the pickle. Katie eyed him skeptically. This is a joke, right? No. He laughed. It's some old German tradition on my dad's side of the family. 
We have this ornament shaped like a pickle, and my dad hides it deep in the branches of the tree. On Christmas morning, whoever finds the pickle first gets an extra present. That's fun. It is, except my brother almost always finds it. <laughs> That's a bummer. Nah, the present always ends up being something for the whole family, so everyone wins out in the end. Katie chewed on her garlic bread and swallowed. What did you get Trina for Christmas? He aimed a sarcastic glare at her. What? I'm supposed to guess? She sipped her wine, and a second later, realization dawned. Oh my god, you didn't get her anything. He grimaced. I'm about to ask for the ring back. I think giving her a gift would be counterproductive. You're going to make her give the ring back? Her mouth dropped open. You're a real hard ass. No, she lied to me about being pregnant. Plus, the ring belonged to my grandmother. There is no way I'm letting her keep it. She poured them both more wine. That's true. I think you need more to drink. I thought my Christmas was going to suck, but yours sounds way worse. He smiled and took a sip. Katie set the bottle down. Do you really think we'll get out of here tomorrow? I do. It'll take time to plow the roads, and because it got dark soon after the snow stopped, it'll be tough to spot my truck or your scarf. Hopefully tomorrow, when it's light, it won't take too long. I know my family, and I guarantee they'll be out looking for us. But to make sure, we should hike out to the road and try to flag someone down. Katie hoped her mom would be out looking for her too, but considering she wouldn't know where to start, she'd probably be sitting home by the phone. Standing out in the cold by the road was probably a good idea, but she didn't look forward to it. However, getting back to civilization and her family would be worth it. Okay, we have a plan, she said. Alex tipped his glass toward hers and she clinked it. And then she remembered something. Oh, I have a surprise. It's dessert. I almost forgot. Don't tell me you found Christmas cookies in the fridge too. What I've got is way better. Katie left her warm spot by the fire and dug through her bags. She returned with a beautifully wrapped package and held it out to Alex. He eyed the silver and white colored paper. I'm pretty sure that isn't really for me, because two days ago, we'd never even met. It was supposed to be for not the boyfriend, but since it's Christmas Eve and I need an excuse not to give him anything, I think you should open it. Are you sure? He eyed the package, and she knew he wanted to open it. Positive, and it will bring me great joy, she smirked. If it brings you joy, then by all means, I'll open it. He snatched the gift from her hand and tore through the paper, revealing a gold foil box. He lifted the cover and grinned. Chocolate. I love you. Katie's heart did a flip, even though she knew the words didn't mean anything. I figure we need a treat more than he does. They're truffles. What's a truffle? He lifted out a chocolate ball. It's rich chocolate ganache dipped in more chocolate. Alex sunk his teeth into the decadent treat. I don't know what you just said, but this is amazing. He tilted his head back and savored the taste. Katie grabbed one, plopped next to him on the couch, and took a bite. God, I love these things. If you don't like this guy, Bill, why did you get him such a great gift? I had to. What if he ends up being my new daddy? She rolled her eyes. Plus, I was counting on him to share. I like your thinking. It never occurred to me to give food for Christmas, but now I think it's brilliant. He went to his backpack and brought back a small package wrapped in newspaper. This isn't wrapped nearly as nice as yours, but it's the thought that counts. He offered her the gift. I didn't give you the chocolates to make you feel guilty. Plus, I'm making you share them. Who is this supposed to be for? She eyed the gift. I bought it for my mom, but she won't mind. As soon as I'm home, she'll be so happy she will care less. Here, open it. Katie accepted the small, heavy package. 
Is this wrapped in the school newspaper? He shrugged and smiled in a way that made her happy all over. I'm going green. He sat back down with only the box of chocolates between them. Katie tore at the paper. I feel terrible opening your mom's gift. Would you feel better if I said it was Trina's? He tilted his head at her quizzically. No! Well, maybe. She sounds horrible. Sorry. I guess that's the wine talking. If it takes a couple glasses of wine to get you to speak your mind, I'll keep it coming. No, I wouldn't want another girl's present. That would be weird. She wanted something he picked out especially for her. Then it's a good thing I didn't get her one. She unwrapped the gift and discovered a scented candle. This is great! I love candles. I bet your mom does too. She teased and took a sniff. Oh, that smells great. Just like Christmas. It's cinnamon. My mom loves it. I get her one every year. Thank you. And thank you to your mom. You're welcome. Are you going to light it? Absolutely. She grabbed the matches from the fireplace mantle, lit the candle, and soon a cinnamon scent wafted throughout the room. Combined with the fire and the fresh pine boughs, the air smelled pretty darn nice. I hear that chocolate goes great with red wine. She stretched her legs out onto the coffee table, happier than she'd been in a long time. Doesn't sound like a bad combination. Let me try it. Alex took a bite of truffle and then a sip of wine. He moaned. Yeah, it's good stuff. Katie tried it too. The creamy ganache melted in her mouth, and the smooth wine added a combination of flavors she couldn't describe. I think I've died and gone to heaven. Beautiful strains of Christmas music floated from her laptop as they ate truffles and sipped wine. Her candle flickered. The fire crackled. Everything was perfect, except that she couldn't get Alex's situation out of her mind. I'm sorry things are so bad with you and Trina, she said. It's my own fault. I should have made it clear from the beginning. I'll get things straightened out and can start living my life again. It's been so long since I've been near a girl, I'm afraid I forgot how. Oh, I doubt that. Based on his earlier kiss, she'd say he knew exactly what he was doing. Weren't there girls at school? In Madison? No. I've always been faithful to Trina. That is, up until this afternoon in the shed. I'm sorry about that. He peeked at her with an impish smile. He didn't look sorry. It's okay. She dipped her head. It was nice. She bit her lip. She shouldn't have said that. She reached for a truffle to fill her mouth with something and stop saying stupid things. Alex's hand covered hers. He gazed at her with something more than casual interest. She gulped, wanting him, but knowing she shouldn't. He leaned across the box of chocolates and kissed her. He tasted of red wine and sweetness, a combination she would never forget and would always associate with Christmas. I know it's not official yet, but in my mind, I'm single. All that's left is the formality of telling the rest of the world. Katie nodded. She did understand, but still felt she was crossing a line she shouldn't. But she didn't care. Alex was here, the most handsome guy she'd ever met. He smelled like the outdoors and a campfire. He tasted like a miracle. If you don't mind, I'm going to kiss you again. He brushed her cheek with the pad of his thumb. I don't mind, she whispered, unable to say anything more coherent. Alex moved the chocolates and eased her into his arms. He kissed her with such tenderness and hunger she thought she'd burst. He wrapped his arms around her like satin ribbon on a priceless gift and gently caressed her back. He curled a hand under her hair and tickled the nape of her neck, all the while kissing her mindless. She sighed in his mouth and felt him smile. You taste so good, he breathed in her ear. Like garlic and onion? She asked. 
No, not that I'd mind, as I happen to love garlic and onion. You taste like dessert, sweet and tangy and decadent. He captured her mouth again, and Katie lost track of time. Chapter 13 A loud rumbling disturbed Katie's slumber. She hated mornings, and she hated waking up early, especially when enjoying such a great dream. Her head ached from too much wine, and her mouth tasted fuzzy and gross. She reached up to scratch her nose. Cold air chilled her face. She tucked her hand back under the covers and snuggled into the comfort of soft covers and a warm, firm body next to her. Katie's eyes popped open. Alex lay facing her, one arm under his pillow, the other over her waist. His face, relaxed and gorgeous, sent her heart into somersaults. She took a moment and enjoyed the view of his tousled hair and perfectly shaped mouth. During the day, she tried not to stare at him in case he caught her. But like this? Ah, the way that man kissed. She smiled, remembering their marathon makeout session, and wiggled her toes. She heard a noise. It sounded like a car door slamming. Oh my God, were they getting rescued? She sat up and Alex's arms slid onto her bare legs. Was it the owners? She glanced around at the empty bottles, chocolate wrappers, and dishes from their Christmas Eve party. Instead of stockings over the fire, stray clothes were draped and drying over chairs. They'd sort of trashed the place. Alex, somebody's here. She nudged him. He stirred. What? Someone knocked on the cabin door. She startled. Wake up! She shook Alex again. Suddenly, the door opened and a young guy entered. He wore a knit hat, a thick coat, and no gloves. Hello? Anybody here? His eyes scanned the cabin and immediately landed on Katie, the pullout bed, and Alex's back. Oh! He averted his eyes. I'm sorry to intrude. I'm trying to find my... Jason? Alex rolled over and sat up, immediately awake. The young guy broke into a huge grin. Alex, you son of a bitch! He stomped the snow off his boots and crossed the room. Alex, wearing nothing more than plaid boxers, met Jason halfway. They exchanged a bear hug and pounded each other on the back. Katie stared at Alex's long legs, lean waist, and muscled chest. She couldn't believe she'd snuggled against him all night. She smoothed her t-shirt and wished she hadn't slipped off her sweatpants last night when she got too warm. Alex's body radiated heat like a furnace. What would his brother think of her? Why am I not surprised it's you that showed up? Alex asked. Both men grinned, and Katie saw the brotherly resemblance. New tires, a snowplow, and the biggest blizzard in years? How could it not be me? Plus, watching mom bite her nails and try not to cry put a damper on the holidays. You really screwed up Christmas. Sorry about that. Alex scratched his head, mussing his hair more. Oh, shoot. I'm sorry. Katie, this is my brother Jason. I told you he loves to play in the snow. Hi, she said, embarrassed to be found in bed with his brother. Her head throbbed, and she knew she looked like hell. She certainly felt like it. Hi, he said. She noticed that Jason fought back a grin as he took in the disarray of the room. It looked like they did a lot more than they should have. Jason turned to his brother. Alex, I should warn you. Alex interrupted before his brother could finish. Jason, Katie made the most amazing meal last night. Alex, Jason started again with a concerned expression. You wouldn't believe what she can cook over a fire. Alex! Jason snapped loudly to get his attention. What? He answered, distracted. I didn't come alone, he said in a quiet voice and tilted his head toward the door. Oh, Alex said. Oh! 
His eyes bugged out and he turned to Katie with a pained expression. What? She wished she could read his mind. The door opened and a whip of a girl appeared. Dressed in a white jacket with a fur-lined hood, she could have modeled in an ad for the Ugg boots she wore. Silky blonde hair, pink glossy lips, and long dark lashes framed her doe eyes. Trina. Katie stared, dumbstruck, at this tiny cream puff who'd invaded her secret snowed over holiday. Alex! Oh my god! She launched herself unexpectedly into his arms. Oh baby, I was super worried. You have no idea. Last night I almost didn't open my Christmas gifts because I was so upset. She hugged and kissed him repeatedly while he tried to hold her off. Katie wanted to evaporate into thin air, but couldn't pry her eyes off of Alex and the white tornado wrapped around him. He held Trina stiffly and set her on her feet. He wiped his mouth and glared at his brother. Jason shrugged. When she heard I was heading out at daybreak to search for you, she insisted on coming. She wouldn't take no for an answer. You know how it is. I was so scared. I cried all night. Trina exclaimed. Katie doubted it, based on Trina's bright eyes and porcelain complexion. Alex peeled Trina's arms from his waist, but she clung to his arm. He glanced at Katie, clearly embarrassed. Katie averted her eyes and grabbed her jeans off the nearby chair. Would she ever get the image of sexy Alex dressed in his underwear and the highly polished Trina out of her mind? Why did Trina have to be here? How did you find us? Alex asked Jason. The police called last night when they found your truck in the river. You sure know how to freak people out. You should have been in the truck. That wasn't exactly a sleigh ride, was it? Alex turned to Katie. Katie glanced at him as she pulled her jeans over her hips. Trina finally noticed her for the first time and startled, as if Katie were a bulging pimple on the end of her nose. Who are you? She said. Trina, this is Katie. I was giving her a ride to her mom's for Christmas. Trina's eyes traveled over Katie's unkempt appearance, making her feel more uncomfortable than if a bunch of drunk frat boys had ogled her. You said you were giving a friend a ride. You never said it was a girl. Trina noticed the tangle of blankets on the sofa bed. She looked from Katie, now buttoning her jeans, to Alex in his boxers. You slept with her. It's not like that. His expressive eyes went straight to Katie. Katie saw so much in their conflicted depths. Was it guilt, regret, or plain old embarrassment at getting caught this way? You cheated on me? Trina asked, her face awash with shock. No, and it wouldn't be cheating on you anyway, would it? He asked pointedly. Ignoring his comment, Trina perused the remains of their little party. She frowned at the empty wine bottles, then poked her French manicured fingernail at the silver wrapping paper and the empty chocolate wrappers. Katie didn't want Trina near their stuff, where she could soil the memories of their special night. Trina's lower lip protruded into a pink, glossy pout. You bought me chocolates and then let her eat them? Alex rolled his eyes. No, not everything is about you, Trina. Katie brought them and shared them with me. Trina emitted a small huff. She reached to pick up Katie's cinnamon candle, burned halfway down the jar. That's mine too. Despite the fact Katie looked like a homeless person and probably smelled like one too, she scooped up the candle. She wasn't about to let this spoiled Kardashian wannabe touch her gift from Alex. And what was with all the makeup? They were in podunk northern Wisconsin for Pete's sake, not at an L.A. movie premiere. Doesn't look like you were suffering very much, Trina whined. I imagined you huddling in a cave somewhere alone. Looks like I missed out on a really good time. How could you? Trina, lay off, Alex said. The temperature in the cabin turned glacial, and it wasn't because the fire had burned out in the wee hours of the morning. Katie crossed her arms and chewed on her lip. She hadn't done anything wrong. Okay, not true. 
She'd fallen for Alex when he still officially belonged to this snotty biatch. What? I'm just saying. I don't think you were exactly suffering. I can't believe I lost sleep over you while the entire time you were whoring around with this... Trina sneered at Katie. This person. I don't even get what you see in her. Trina, enough! Alex yelled, and Trina actually shut up, but she still glared at Katie. Alex frowned and shook his head. Katie avoided Trina's stare and glanced around the cabin, her eyes settling on Alex and then his brother. Well, do you guys want to stay here all day or do you want to go home? Jason asked. Let's get the heck out of here, Alex said, with the first note of optimism since Trina walked in. Yeah, the sooner the better, Katie mumbled. Trina plopped onto a chair near Alex and watched Katie's every move. Alex shook his head. Trina, why don't you wait in the truck? No, I think I'll stay here. She gave him an icy glare and returned her eyes to Katie. I'm sure Katie would like to get dressed without you. But you're staying. I don't trust her. She whispered loud enough that Katie could hear. For crying out loud, Trina, get in the damn truck. You're acting like a two-year-old. Alex grabbed the arm of her coat and pulled her to her feet. Jason stepped forward. Come on, Trina. Let's wait in the truck where it's warm. I've got a radio in that we found them. Trina stomped her designer boot-covered feet out of the cabin, slamming the door behind her. Wow, she's a real treat, Katie said. For a girl who tricked her boyfriend into marriage, she still acted like she owned the guy. If what Alex said was true, he'd been trying to break it off with her and she wouldn't let him go. I told you. Alex rubbed his hand over his face. You need a hand? Otherwise, I'll be in the truck. Jason said, his hand on the door. Can you get a message to my mom for me? Katie asked. That's why I'm radioing in. Cell phone service here is spotty at best. Your mom reported you missing the night before last and said you were riding with someone named Alex. The cops put it together, and my parents and your mom have been in touch. She knows we're all out searching. Thank you. I really appreciate it. At least that was one bright spot in this mess. No problem. Jason gave Katie a warm smile, which was a nice change after Trina, the pint-sized arrogant snit. Jason left them alone in the chilly cabin. Katie sighed in relief. What a way to wake up. She longed for a couple pain relievers and a gallon of water. Merry Christmas, Alex grimaced. She gave him a reluctant smile. Merry Christmas. She slipped into the bathroom and finished changing. When she came out, Alex had dressed in his jeans and pulled his sweatshirt back on. He was folding the sofa bed back into the couch. Let me help you. She put the cushions back in place and folded a blanket. I know things are really messed up right now with Trina and everything, but I really enjoyed spending time with you. Alex looked so earnest as he rolled a sheet into an unruly clump. So did I. All Katie could think about was the hours she'd spent in his arms, making out in front of the crackling fire. I'm sorry Trina was so... Bitchy? She offered. Despite Trina's little performance, it was clear she didn't care about anyone other than herself. He laughed. Yeah, that's about right. She had no right to talk to you that way. That's okay. She's nothing to me. I'm glad you figured her out and aren't going to marry her. You'd be very unhappy. Katie prayed he still planned to break it off. I dodged a bullet with her, that's for sure. When are you going to do it? Break up? As soon as possible. Not at my place with my family. I need to go to her place where her parents will be there to pick up the pieces. She tends to be high drama. Gee, I didn't notice. They picked up the dishes and empty bottles. I feel terrible about leaving behind a mess. I wish we could do something about the broken window and all the stuff we ate. Don't worry. My dad will call it into the cops, and we'll figure out whose place it is and let them know. 
Dad will probably be over here tomorrow installing a new window. What about your truck? I forgot all about it. I hope it's okay. If it's still there, I'll have it towed out. Hopefully it didn't suffer too much damage. This has been quite the Christmas. And to think how mad I was about having to come up north. If I hadn't, I never would have met you. I'm glad you did. They gathered up their bags, her candle tucked safely in her backpack. It was Katie's only proof of her time with Alex. He hadn't said anything about seeing her again. She heaved her pack over her shoulder and pasted a smile on her face. Well, I think that's it. Yeah, I guess we've got everything. His eyes turned thoughtful. You know, maybe after... A loud blast of the truck horn sounded. Her heart dropped. She wanted him to finish his sentence, but he didn't. I guess Jason is ready. No, that was Trina. Ah. I guess we better go. She grabbed her remaining bag. At the door, Alex paused with his hand on the knob. He seemed about to speak, but another blast from the truck sounded. He opened the door. Katie passed inches from him, more aware of him than ever before. His scent, the angle of his jaw, and his must hair. She crossed the threshold, then glanced back one final time. When she thought of Christmas, she'd always remember their time here. Katie turned and entered the chill reality of a new day. Chapter 14 Alex smiled in satisfaction as Katie's mom hugged her tight. She'd run outside without a coat the moment Jason pulled up in his truck. Thank God you're safe, she said. Katie didn't pull away. Alex was glad to see them together and happy. Her younger sister hugged Katie from the side while not the boyfriend stood by looking pleased. It's okay, Mom. I'm here. Katie patted her mother's back. Her mom stood back and held Katie's face. You have no idea how terrified I was. Seriously, I swear I'm never letting you out of my sight again. She pulled Katie into another bear hug. Alex waited silently, his brother at his side, while Trina sulked in the truck. Thank God she didn't get out to meet everyone. After her obnoxious behavior during the ride over, he wanted to throttle her. During the trip to drop Katie off, Trina insisted on sitting on his lap in the crowded truck cab. She kept glaring at Katie. He couldn't get her off his lap fast enough. Katie's mom finally released her. Katie turned, and with a sweet smile Alex liked to think Katie reserved only for him, said, Mom, this is Alex Walker. If he hadn't found that cabin, I don't know what would have happened. And this is his brother, Jason. Thank you so much for taking care of Katie. Is it okay if I hug you? I'm a hugger, and I'm thankful to have her back. Sure. Alex smiled and received her embrace. Katie rolled her eyes. He winked at her. What would he do when Katie wasn't around? Her mom released him. Would you kids like to come in for some hot chocolate or something to eat? She looked at not the boyfriend as if wanting approval. Absolutely. We'd like to hear all about your adventure, Bill said. Thank you, but my parents are waiting and we need to get back, Alex said, wishing he had more time with Katie. Of course, I'm sure they've worried sick and it's Christmas, Katie's mom said. He longed for a private moment with Katie, but knew it wouldn't happen. Everyone watched them, especially Trina. I guess we should get going, Jason prompted. Alex wanted to tell Katie how the last two days had been the time of his life and that he would never forget their Christmas Eve, but he couldn't put any of it into words. Would it be okay to hug her goodbye? It seemed too forward, even though her mom had hugged him. Instead of speaking from his heart, he blurted, Once I get my truck towed out of the river, I'll bring you your duffel bag and whatever else you left. Thanks. That'd be great. Katie's eyes searched his, but he knew a simple look couldn't convey his feelings. Drive careful, Bill said, shaking hands with Jason and then Alex. Katie's mom stood shivering in the cold, her arms folded across her chest to stay warm. 
I guess we'll be going then. He nodded to Katie. Her eyes looked troubled. What did she want to say to him? Was she glad to be rid of him? Probably, especially after Trina's behavior. He climbed into the truck. Jason backed out of the narrow driveway. Snow was piled high on both sides. Katie's mother led her into the warmth of the log home. His heart twisted as she disappeared from sight. Alex's reality sat next to him, her perfume choking away his breath. After a long, hot shower, some aspirin, and a nap, Katie felt human again. Wearing her 16-year-old sister's jeans and a hoodie, she joined her mom and sister at the dining room table in Not the Boyfriend's massive cabin. He seemed nice enough, but his taste in decorating was a bit on the wild side for her tastes. A deer head with a huge rack of antlers adorned the space over the massive fireplace. Another deer head hung in the entryway. Taxidermy fish, various birds, and a fox were mounted throughout the spacious cabin. Worse, they all seemed to be watching her. Her mom set a bowl of steaming vegetables on the table among the other dishes. Katie didn't recognize them. What's that? It doesn't look like potatoes. They're root vegetables. Rutabaga, parsnip, and beets. Try them, they're good. Her mom sat, reached for Katie's hand, and gave it a squeeze. I can't believe all that you've been through. It's a miracle the two of you are okay. And Alex, what a resourceful young man. And a total hottie, Nicole added. Katie grinned at her sister. He sure is. She still couldn't believe she spent two days with him. Bill appeared with a dish towel over his shoulder and a serving platter in his hands. I can't wait for you to try the quail. I shot them last fall, and they've been waiting in the freezer for a special occasion like tonight. He gazed at her mom with a loving expression that should have been delivered by Katie's father. Katie examined the small headless birds and swallowed her distaste. Mom, where's the ham? She asked under her breath. Her mom always served honeyed ham and mashed potatoes at Christmas. Did Alex put the moves on you? Nicole asked. Nicole, her mother scolded, glancing at Bill to see if he heard. What? Nicole complained. They were snowed in for two days. There would be something wrong with the guy if he didn't. Katie glared at Nicole to get her to shut her trap, but Nicole misunderstood and read more into it. Oh my God, he totally hit on you, didn't he? Nicole dropped her fork on her plate, creating a clatter. Katie thought of Alex kissing her in front of the fire. She'd never experienced anything more romantic in her life. Alex's hands had roamed as he kissed her. She hadn't stopped him. Your face is turning red. I can't believe it. Spill it. Nicole pounded on the table. Bill frowned. Her mom shook her head in embarrassment. Katie kicked her sister. Nicole, shut up. There's nothing to tell. Yeah, I bet, she said with a satisfied grin. Bill returned with another dish. And for the piece de la resistance, he said in a fake French accent and set down a platter filled with the most disgusting fish Katie had ever seen. The entire fish, heads and tails intact, their beady little eyes staring. Are you kidding me? She shot a look of disbelief at her mom. Mom didn't really expect them to eat barely dead fish. They weren't cavemen. She liked her fish boneless, breaded, and baked. Her mother, wearing way too much makeup, nodded with a forced smile. Isn't it wonderful how hard Bill worked to give us this woodsy Christmas dinner? It's nothing. I love to cook, and it's called a wild dinner, not woodsy. Everything we're enjoying tonight was growing or living in the wild when it was gathered or caught. You mean slaughtered? Katie stared at the tiny bird carcasses. She'd never look at a robin in the same light again. She'd eaten more delicious food with Alex at the cabin. Bill sat at the head of the table. Don't be shy, dig in. He stabbed a quail with his fork and dropped it on his plate. Katie and Nicole looked expectantly at their mother. Mom? 
When she didn't respond, Katie said under her breath, It's Christmas. Aren't we going to say grace? Her mother glanced at Nicole and then back at Katie. Her mom seemed uncomfortable. It's okay, honey. We don't need to when we're at someone else's home, she whispered. But it's Christmas, Katie persisted. They always said grace before dinner, and it seemed more important this Christmas than ever before. What am I missing? Bill asked. It's nothing. The girls are used to saying grace before Christmas dinner, but it's good to do things differently, too, she said with a light tone. It's tradition, Nicole blurted. You can pray. How does it go? Bill set his utensils down. Would you like to say grace, Katie? Her mom asked. No, she didn't want to say grace. Her dad always started grace, but he wasn't here and never would be again. Nicole sat with her shoulders sagging and stared at her glass of milk. Bill commanded the head of the table, ignorant of how painful he'd made Christmas for Katie and her sister. Her mom adorned the other end of the table, wearing a clingy top designed for a much younger woman. She seemed far more interested in keeping Bill's eye than helping her daughters get through their first Christmas without their dad. No, never mind. I'm fine. She needed this night to end. I don't mind. Please, go ahead, Bill urged. Let it rest. Didn't he see it was all wrong? She should have kept her mouth shut. Katie, if you want to say grace, this is the time to do it. Bill worked very hard on this meal and the food is getting cold. Her mother snapped. Katie knew how much her mom wanted to impress, not the boyfriend. The doorbell rang, giving her a reprieve. I'll get that. Bill set his napkin on the table and answered the door while the dead fish stared at the girls. What's gotten into you, Katie? Her mom asked. Me? What about you? Dad always said grace on Christmas. It was a tradition. And what's with this meal? Who eats this stuff? There's someone to see you, Katie, Bill said from the hallway. Katie rose, confused. Who could possibly be at the door for her? And then she realized it could only be Alex. Her pulse took off. Alex would understand why she was so upset. Maybe he could get her out of this freak show. She rounded the corner, unable to hide her excitement and came up short. Alex's brother stood in the front hall. Oh, hi, Jason. He sensed her disappointment and offered her a half smile. Hi, Alex asked me to drop your stuff off. She noticed her duffel bag of dirty laundry and tattered shopping bag at his feet. Alex didn't want to deliver it himself. Oh, thanks. Now I won't have to keep borrowing my sister's clothes. Where was Alex? He must not want to see her again. How's his truck? She asked, but really wanted to ask why Alex didn't come himself. She supposed Trina put the kibosh on it. Amazingly good. He was even able to drive it home once we got it pulled out. There was a lot of ice on it. I bet. Hello, Jason. Her mom appeared around the corner with Nicole and Bill. Hi, Mrs. Brandt. My dad asked me to let you know that he has contacted the owner and taken care of fixing the cabin's broken window. Thank you. That's generous of him. Have him be sure to let me know if there's anything I can do. Her mom said. Where's Alex? Nicole asked. Jason shot a quick glance Katie's direction. He's at Trina's house. Katie sensed everyone's eyes on her. Thanks for bringing my stuff back. I really appreciate it, she said with false cheer. No problem. I've got to get back. We're celebrating Christmas tonight. Katie returned to the table where the others began eating. She fought her emotions. Alex was with Trina now, and they all knew it. She hoped he was breaking off the engagement, but what if he wasn't? Had she been used by a guy who had no intention of leaving his girlfriend? Her throat tightened. She kept her eyes focused on her plate where she added what she assumed was a rutabaga and a whole wheat roll. Bill rattled on about the type of gunshot used to bring down a deer. She fought the urge to run to her room and bury herself under the covers. She just wanted to go home. 
Chapter 15 By the next day, Katie was ready to tear her hair out. This monstrous cabin was too big and everything here felt foreign. Bill offered to take everyone ice fishing. Did he not realize they were city girls? Nicole took pity on the guy and finally agreed to give it a try. Her mom stayed back with Katie, and after a long morning of avoiding each other, mom sat down on the opposite end of the couch. Apparently, it was time to have a talk. Katie, what's going on? You've been out of sorts. It's not like you to act rude. Her mom clutched her coffee mug. Mom, I've been out of sorts ever since you and dad split. How could I be anything else? And how could her mom not see that? Her mother stiffened, gripped her mug tighter, and stared blankly out the window. See? Anytime I even mention that our lives have taken a 180, you clam up and pretend nothing's wrong. Sometimes things change. It's not your fault, she said in a patronizing tone. I know it's not my fault, but don't I at least deserve an explanation of why one day you and Dad are laughing at my grad party and two weeks later he's peeling out of the driveway with his suits in the back of his car? I've heard this things change bullshit for six months. Her mom sighed and shook her head. Why did you separate? Are you getting a divorce? I assume you are since you're shacking up with, with Bill. Katie, that's uncalled for. And I told you, Bill is just a friend. Katie mimicked. Mom, I'm not stupid. Stop treating me like I'm three. You drag Nicole and me up here for the most horrible Christmas of our lives? Why would you punish us like this? Don't we deserve something normal? Her mom set her mug on the coffee table. The situation between your father and me doesn't concern you or your sister. And quite honestly, the details are none of your business. Her mother might as well have slapped her across the face. It's my family too, Katie said quietly. Katie, after 20 years, my world fell apart around me. It's all I can do to get through each day. You have no idea what I've been through. But what about what I've been through? And Nicole? It couldn't be helped. Your collateral damage. You sound like Bill. I'm sorry you're hurting, but there's nothing I can do about it. I spent a lifetime raising you girls and busting my back trying to please your father. After all this time, I deserve to have my life back. Why can't you see that I deserve to be happy? I'm not saying you can't be happy but I do want some answers about things that affect my life. One minute you're with Dad and the next you're with Bill and insisting he's not your boyfriend. Come on, I have eyes. Look at how you're dressed. Her mother wore skin-tight, low-rise designer jeans and a cleavage-exposing, tight top. Her mother bristled. What I do is none of your business. I am a grown woman and I don't have to explain my actions. Well, I don't like what you're doing. It's not right. You're not even divorced yet. You're sleeping with a guy and you're still married. Separated. There's a huge difference. And the divorce will be final next month. Katie's jaw dropped. And when were you going to tell me? Or were you? Don't my feelings count for anything? She fought the tears that welled. You don't understand, Katie. This is not about you. This is about your father and me. We're both happier this way. I'm glad someone is, because I'm sure not. How much longer do I have to stay here? Until the day after tomorrow. Her mother stood and picked up her mug. I see it was a mistake to bring you here. You're clearly not ready. She walked away. Katie called after her. You think? Oh my God. How could her mom possibly think Katie was ready to share in her new world? She hadn't come to terms with saying goodbye to the old world yet. The front door opened. Bill and Nicole entered. Look what we caught. Nicole pointed to the string of fish Bill held. Lunch, Bill bragged. Nicole smiled, clearly accepting this new change better than Katie. That's great. Katie grabbed her coat from the closet and phone from the entry table. Where are you going? Her mother asked in an irritated tone. For some air. I can't breathe in here. Katie slipped into her coat and out of the cabin. 
The cool, crisp air was a nice switch from the stifled, conflicted air inside. The scent of the woods reminded her of the cabin she'd shared with Alex. Was that only yesterday? She missed it, and him. Kind of like the year she went to summer camp and had to say goodbye to her new best friend, Jessica. It took her a long time to stop missing her. And now, Katie couldn't imagine ever getting over her feelings of those two days snowed over with the sweetest guy she'd ever met. She wandered the long driveway to the main road. Her phone rang, disturbing the pristine silence. She pulled it from her pocket, half expecting the caller to be her mom scolding her or telling her to come back. Instead, it was Alex. Her heart swelled. Hello. Hi. How was your Christmas? His voice sounded like smooth velvet. Sucks, you, she said. Ditto. What are you doing? She glanced at the bend in the driveway. Right now? Running away. Alex laughed. Really? No, but I would if I could. God, she loved hearing his voice. Listen, I'm heading back to Madison in the morning to escape the landslide of disaster I've created. Any chance you want to ride? She stopped in her tracks. Please tell me you're not teasing, because if you are, I'm going to take you down. I would never do that, he said. I swear, if you're kidding, I'll drive your truck into the river. Too late. It's already been done. I'll pick you up at nine. Don't be late. I never am. Chapter 16 He was late! Katie checked her watch again. 9.15 a.m. She shivered. If she was smart, she would go back inside Bill's cabin to wait. But then she'd have to deal with her mom again. It was clear that they would not see eye to eye on anything for a long time. Her mom didn't understand how much her actions impacted her kids. During a second argument last night, her mom said that because Katie was 18 and an adult, her mom was more or less done raising her. Whatever had gone down between Katie's parents, it had changed her mom into someone Katie didn't recognize, or even especially like right now. At least her mom's attitude made it easier for Katie to leave. In fact, her mom seemed relieved that she wouldn't have to deal with Katie for another two days. The cool air penetrated her coat. At least this time she wore her boots and not athletic shoes. She peered down the road and saw a vehicle come into view. A second later, she recognized Alex's blue pickup. Her heart rate took off. The truck slowed and stopped next to her. She opened the door. Hey, Katie. He smiled, and she fell in love with his face all over again. Hi. She grinned back. Was there any chance that he was as happy to see her as she was to see him? Alex hopped out and walked around the truck. Here, let me help you. He took her large duffel and tossed it in the back. He reached for her backpack, but she pulled it away. Thanks, but I'll keep it with me. My laptop is in there. Okay. He reached for the shopping bag. I'll keep these up front, too. They're presents from my mom and sister. I wouldn't want anything to happen to them. She watched him, hoping for some sign that he was glad to see her. Alex raised an eyebrow. Suit yourself. He paused and stared at her. She wished she could read his thoughts. He reached into his coat pocket and pulled out her red scarf. She'd forgotten all about it. With gentle hands, Alex wrapped the scarf around her neck and tucked it in. She smiled. The scarf smelled like Alex. His fingers grazed her cheek. He peered into her eyes, then leaned forward and captured her mouth. The familiar touch of his lips on hers sent warm shivers through her. He kissed her long and slow. She savored his sweetness. His lips pulled away. Katie sighed. Alex gave a satisfied nod, walked around, and hopped back in the truck. Katie glowed all over. Wasting no time, she maneuvered her remaining bags into the cab and climbed in. It was a tight fit. She squeezed her bags to the floor and noticed the cup holder. There were two cups of steaming coffee side by side. New Year's Eve. 
Come on, give me a hint. Where are we going? Katie begged Alex to tell. He grinned. You'll know soon enough. They walked hand in hand, their fingers threaded together. He and Katie had hung out a couple times since returning to Madison a few days ago, but this was their first official date, and he planned to make it a date she'd never forget. Ever since Alex had broken it off with Trina on Christmas Day, he'd never felt happier. Sitting at Trina's kitchen table with both her parents, he had pointed out Trina's lies about the pregnancy and the fact that they were different people now than they were in high school. Trina took it better than he thought. She didn't have a tantrum or call him names. Her dad didn't hit him, but her mother did cry. Trina managed to get a jab in when she handed back the ring. She said she'd always wanted a bigger diamond anyway. He heard that the next day she was out with another guy. Alex squeezed Katie's hand as they turned the corner. They joined a huge stream of people walking toward the Cole Center, the university's athletic complex where all the big events took place. Are we going to a hockey game? She asked. Alex laughed. No, this will be much better than a hockey game. I thought we should start a new tradition of our own. Like getting snowed in at a cabin every Christmas? Yeah, something like that. They crossed the street with a crowd of others. Katie spotted tour buses up ahead. Is that what I think? <gasps> oh, Alex! She pulled him along until she could get a closer view. A row of tour buses and semi-trailers lined the street. The Trans-Siberian Orchestra logo was painted across them. I can't believe you remembered. She hugged him. How could I forget? He went on and on about them. I didn't even realize they were in town. I guess with my parents' separation, I never paid attention to when the band was coming. I knew I wasn't going to see them. Well, you are now. He lowered his forehead to hers. Having you climb into my truck is the best thing that ever happened to me. Katie grinned. Me too. Alex kissed her sweet mouth. Snow began to fall. Katie led him toward the building. Come on, let's go. We don't want to be late. The end. This has been Snowed Over. Written by Angie Stanton. Narrated by Amber Wallace. Copyright 2012 by Angie Stanton. Production copyright 2013 by Angie Stanton.